Uh, good morning and welcome to the 32nd meeting of 2017 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. We have apologies today from colleagues Corey Beamish and Finlay Carson. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I want to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as these may affect the broadcasting system. The first item of business today is to hear evidence from two panels in relation to the committee's scrutiny of the Scottish Government's draft budget 2018-19. We will hear firstly from Colin Campbell, the Chief Executive of the James Hutton Institute, Graham Cook, Director of Safari Gateway, Professor uh, Julie Fitzpatrick of the Morden Research Institute, uh, Raggy Lowe, Programme Manager for Climate uh, Exchange, and Dr Jackie McElhenney, Head of the Food Protection Science and Surveillance Branch of the Food Standards Scotland. Uh, members have a series of questions uh, for you, and we will move straight to those. Uh, John Scott. Um, thank you very much, uh, convener, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to come and help us with this budget inquiry this morning. Um, budgets is the first question, and uh, we would like, I'd like to ask you, what have the main impacts of declining research funding from the Scottish Government been on your various institutes, and what have you done to mitigate the declining budgets? Uh, yeah, good morning, and thanks for the opportunity to come today. Um, obviously, declining budgets mean we need to take various measures. Um, one of the first things is to, to seek alternative funding from other means. And, um, for example, in the case of the James Hutton Institute, that's meant seeking funding from increasingly from in, uh, through things like the industrial strategy uh, from Europe and um, from other sort of other non-Scottish government public sector sources. Uh, that's been quite successful. Uh, we've been very successful in Europe, for example, at winning money. Uh, one of the most successful institutions in the agri-environment sector, in fact. Um, but obviously that's now also got some uncertainties around it in terms of Europe, although some welcome news just this week around Horizon 2020. Um, but we've also had to cut costs, and that's meant uh, reducing staff numbers, um, changing terms and conditions, and a variety of other cost reduction measures. Thank you. Others? Jim? We would be similar. Um, trying to generate external research income is really critical and like the other um, main research providers, we've been very successful in gaining large EU grants. Uh, but we've also been able to generate some money from UK budgets because the Morden Research Institute was fortunate to be eligible to apply for some of these grants. These are grants from Research Council UK, which for many years we were not able to access for a number of different reasons. So our income has been maintained by those um, activities. We've also tried to increase our commercialisation of our r research, trying to take it through to products which um, have a small return in royalties. Um, and Morden is slightly different that we're part of a group of companies and charities. So some of our commercial subsidiaries have helped to support the work through gift aid so they are not-for-profit companies, so they gifted some of the money back to the institutes, which we then continue to do more research with. But like uh, the James Hutton Institute, we've managed essentially by not replacing staff when they have retired or left the organisation. Um, as I, I think the committee are aware, um, Safari is the, the construct which is the Scottish Environment, Food and Agriculture Research uh, Institutes is the collective of uh, six research institutes, including uh, the Mordun and James Hutton Institute. And Safari Gateway, uh, of which I'm the director, is uh, essentially the knowledge exchange and impact hub of Safari. Um, our budget is relatively small uh, compared to the SRP and so on. Um, but actions we've been taking include uh, developing joint funding mechanisms, uh, for example, around a fellowship programme, uh, something which we're working with, for example, with Food Standards Scotland uh, and others. Uh, and we're also using the Safari vehicle uh, as a mechanism to strengthen position uh, in regard to uh, bidding for uh, funds in relation to things like research council calls and so on. And you go. Um, so as a centre of expertise, we're funded solely by the Scottish Government. We're a kind of um, policy-facing, uh, fast response service for the for Scottish Government policy teams. So we are more dependent, perhaps, than others around the table on um, Scottish Government funding. We don't have a legal uh, uh, 
identity, so we're not able to raise funds. We're a, a consortium, if you like. Um, having said that, uh, we have been using our access to other research networks across the UK very strategically to try to leverage better insights into the Scottish um, Government and into our own research community, things like the UK Energy Research Centre, which is one of our major partners. Uh, so we're being as canny as we can, but with um, shrinking budgets. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I should have declared an interest as an honorary fellow of the Morden Institute before I started, but I do so now. Um, my next question is, is, has the amount of research required reduced proportionately with the budget reductions, or have you actually replaced the falling amounts of funding with funding that you've sought from elsewhere? Go on. Yeah, inevitably the research has uh, declined. Um, we can't do as many things as we would like to do, and I think um, there's an opportunity missed here. We actually have got many ideas about ways in which we can increase productivity, uh, have bigger econ economic impact, make it Scotland more sustainable. We can't do all of those with when there's less money. Uh, and the money is um, specifically for particular research deliverables uh, within the programme of search, for example, and these have to go when we, we cut back. Um, you can replace some of those with other funding sources, but other funding sources have slightly different agendas and priorities. So it's not a, a straight like-for-like like type of comparison. And what's really important about the Strategic Research Programme, for example, is that it's about long-term mission-orientated research. It's the bedrock of lots of other sort of ways of actually winning additional funding. So by, by cutting that bedrock, you potentially cut down your options for getting other alternative types of funding which build on it. I would I would support Colin in everything that he says. It's it's um, it certainly has reduced our capacity to work on a number of really key areas which are emerging at the moment. Um, we are we are capable and we are doing work on antimicrobial resistance, for example, but it's obviously become incredibly topical and there are very large amounts of money about to be. Uh, released for that topic, and so it is. It's difficult when um, when the budgets mean that it's harder to employ new and young scientists into new and topical areas that we would be able to continue to to generate income. So huge opportunities for uh, new science and new technology at the moment, and it's it's frustrating not to be able to do more. So it's not that the amount of work to do has declined, it's just that you are able to do less with the budgets no, available to you. Absolutely, and I think, you know, within within Scotland, obviously, the kind of agri-tech sector is, is very important in terms of food production and protection of the environment, yeah. and there's huge opportunities to get technology out there, and Scotland is actually doing very well in that, and it, it would be frustrating if that's, uh, that's reduced in terms of effort and impact. Yeah, I, th I think there's a huge opportunities at the moment. Uh, you know, the opportunities for innovation and actually sort of creating jobs and creating wealth are very, very large at the moment in the agri-tech centre. And, and it should be a matter of actually more money will give us more economic return. Um, in James Sutton Institute, for example, it's £12.75 return for every pound invested in the James Sutton Institute. And that's true of the other research institutes. And in that respect, they're different from uh, universities and others. And it's because we have a translational pipeline. We do strategic through to applied and translational research and give great economic return. So we're missing opportunities to actually help create wealth uh, and, and, and address issues about sustainability. So more money would make an even bigger difference. If I could also comment, Morden's uh, gross value added is about 10 to 1. And in terms of jobs, it's about 5.5 to 1. So for every job supported by government, we support another 5.5 jobs um, in the Scottish economy, particularly in Midlothian, where we're based. Um, but there's also the, the opportunity and, and the, the work that we've done over the years about translation, actually trying to get our knowledge out there to our different communities to make sure that the technology is taken up and use. So I think the institutes do stand out in, in, in our view, uh, particularly with that translation of research all the way through to use in the field or the, uh, the in practice. Thank um, you. Uh, I would just follow up uh, Julie's point there um, by saying that one of the things which has happened as a result of the construct of Safari and Safari Gateway is uh, the creation of a bit of headspace uh, to be able to build on the knowledge exchange activities that the institutes were already carrying out. 
Um, and I guess that includes taking the research which um, they uh, produce and delivering it to key audiences of business and policy and society and so on. Can I just ask Mr Cook, um, given the work you've been doing in Safari, have you thus far identified any overlap or duplication of research that might have been taken place previously? Um, not from my perspective, but the landscape is complex and uh, I think I've been in this role for just over a year now and I would recognise that not only is the research landscape complex in relation to um, how it is funded, but also how it is configured in relation to the research institutes, the centres of expertise, uh, higher education institutes and so on. And we've been working hard with all of those to try and help uh, understand where uh, collaborative work works together and where we can add value in those uh, types of areas. Um, and uh, I guess for me this does come back to who the ultimate audiences should be and those have been identified for us and were identified in the tender which set up Safari Gateway as those three of um, business and policy and society but also with an overarching um, remit to try and internationalise further the research that's carried out principally across Safari. But the more I'm in this role, I, the more I see that collaboration is absolutely crucial. And perhaps Julie and Colin and others um, uh, would be able to tell you more about where that interaction takes place. I will come on to that in a minute because there's very obvious examples with the more than that quite recently. Colin Campbell, did you want to come in there? Yeah, just this, this issue about duplication, I think, is um, the the research institute has been working for a very long time now on joint research programmes and I think one of the things that's unique in the Scottish system is that we've done that uh, where other funders haven't. Uh, what that's meant has been a natural alignment of our capabilities over that period of time. We're talking sort of 10, 12, maybe even 15 years arguably how we've been doing that and, and therefore we've naturally sort of come to a situation where we complement each other mostly. Um, and I think that that gives us great strength in terms of delivering this joint research programme together. Safari gives us even more opportunity to do that in the, in the future, I think. And um, it's really important to also realise that science has changed fundamentally over the last 10 to 15 years. The nature of science means you need bigger and bigger collaborative teams. It's not just about collaborating in Scotland, it's about collaborating in Europe and collaborating globally. Some of the work we do, for example, on the barley genome, you know, there are 50, 60 different authors on one single paper. It's a huge international consortium because it's, it's big science. And, uh, you know, we have to collaborate and the nature of science is collaboration. Okay. Does anyone want to come back on Mr Scott's original point there? Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, so how do you think then the Scottish research programme should evolve? You perhaps already discussed that, Mr Campbell. You might want to go further or, yeah. or not. Yeah, I think there are, there are a lot of pressing needs um, in, in Scotland around uh, growing the economy, uh, addressing climate change. Uh, we've got very progressive policies, I think, in Scotland, which actually help to stretch the science, indeed, in terms of having ambitious targets for our environmental policies in particular. And there are more policies coming in the future. And we've got a, potentially a, a Good Food Nation bill, for example, which is, could be equally progressive and uh, innovative, and there will therefore be research needs for that. Um, now, th these immediate needs are things we can address, but actually we need to keep an, I an idea on the long-term needs as well. We don't know what questions we're going to have to answer in 10 to 15 years' time. The, the strength of the strategic research programme is it's a long-term mission-orientated research programme. We did research in the 1980s, for example, around um, peatlands, um, for example, which is bearing fruit today because we can estimate the amount of carbon locked up in our peatlands. Um, but it, going back when we first did that research, we were interested in how much peat we would burn for power stations. You know, so the, the questions change. The need for fundamental information about Scotland's natural resource remains the same. So we need to take a very long-term view about what we need, and I think for that reason, we need to sort of make sure we've got the long-term mission-orientated research and the strategic research programme fully supported. And it's a, it's a question of balance. Um, we've got centres, which I think have been very good at sort of relating the research to immediate short-term policy orientated questions um, and we've got the strategic research program which is about that core research that we have to do you've got to get the balance of that right and i would suggest that we we've, we've got good ideas around the centers but we now need to sort of consolidate on that core research and make sure that it's there for the future it's as I say the bedrock of what we do thank you if i could 
just add to that, uh, again, I would agree. Um, I think it's really important that we horizon scan. We do that regularly, but I think that needs to be done with the Scottish Government, uh, with the RESAS budgets, clearly involving multiple stakeholders, but trying to look into the future and to design uh, collaborative projects that are going to deliver in the areas that we're particularly interested in. That's in the area of infectious disease of our livestock species, including diseases that pass to humans. So we know we've now got really good technologies which allow us to produce new vaccines and better diagnostic tests for animal disease. And that's going to be really important if we're to reduce the impact of um, reducing antimicrobial drugs, for example. But it's also within the context of improving the environment, supporting the environment, and also supporting the Scottish economy and the people who live in many of our rural areas. The rural communities in Scotland are particularly important uh, for many of our scientific outputs. So it is a collaborative effort, and I think the planning needs to be done across the, the whole piece with all of our scientists working together. So lots of interactions between animal scientists, plant scientists, environmental scientists, and, and social scientists as well. Thank you. Um, it's perhaps important to recognise that um, the funding from the Scottish Government of uh, a lot of the research carried out across Safari funds research which would not ordinarily be funded, and that's, uh, that's one point. I guess another is perhaps to bring an example to the table where uh, work that's done uh, across the Safari Institutes can deliver both immediate policy needs and those longer term considerations as well. So if you consider the example of the rest and be thankful, where uh, we know that from time to time, Scottish Government transport ministers uh, have to uh, um, um, make judgments on what to do in relation to the stability of the slopes and so on. So uh, I had one of my colleagues, uh, a soil scientist, uh, one of the uh, Safari Gateway team as well, who showed me a cross-section of um, a crop route, and my job can be essentially sometimes to say, well, so what? Um, and he said, well, this bit gives it its bendiness, this bit gives it its strength. And I said, well, so what? And he said, if you plant that in the right place, it can stabilise uh, a hillside. So my question was, well, and so what? <laughs> so there was a full stop there. And the next element of that conversation was around saying, if we get that right and we get the right people in the right room, and we get that planted in the right place, we can have a direct policy impact in relation to issues which uh, the Scottish Government Transport Scotland have to deal with every year. Um, and the more we unpick that particular issue, I'm finding that there are lots of other people. I use that example elsewhere, Forestry Commission Scotland. I used it at the University of uh, Northumbria uh, last week where I was at a Natural Environment Research Council event. And the more I'm in this role, the more I see things like consideration of catchments as a whole, thinking about who's involved, land managers and so on, and joining those things up. And I think Safari and the research that it carries out offers a platform to think about these things in a more holistic manner. Okay. I'll go first. Um, yes, so there are three centres of expertise already established under the strategic programme funding from RESAS. Um, there, is, there was a, a fourth mooted hasn't yet been funded, I would argue that we need to continue that uh, capacity in the translational role between the, the fundamental science and policy making to inform better um, decisions. Um, there's an open question about how many of these centres you might need and how long they might need to last for to do that job, but I would say that that is a fundamental <laughs> element that needs to continue to be funded um, and that generates real impact in terms of better decision making. Many thanks. Okay, thanks. Okay, let's move this on and look at the focus of the uh, strategic research programme, and um, we'll bring in Dr. Jackie McElhenney. Um, Food Standards Scotland, in, in your written submission, state there is a need to properly align the work to strategic policy relating to food protection and public health, and the SRP should place greater focus on applied research, which is able to demonstrate clear policy application and is sufficiently flexible to adapt to changing priorities. In the first instance, can I ask you to expand on that and for the other panel members, if you feel the need to contribute to, to comment on it? Dr. Dr. McElhenney. Yes, thank you very much. Um, those comments were, were really about um, 
the opportunities there are for aligning the, the expertise um, that's been developed within the Strategic Research Programme to the, the, the policy priorities for Food Standards Scotland, and that would be um, dietary health and food standards and food safety. Um, we've had some great examples over the year, years of, of collaboration with um, the SRP. Um, food Standards Scotland has really welcomed the opportunity to, to steer the programme. We've seen great developments over the past couple of years, particularly with the advent of Safari, which has really opened up the opportunity for collaboration. Our comments in relation to um, that, the, the point that you've just raised, were really around um, the current policy in relation to um, obesity strategy that's recently been released by Scottish Government, which fully aligns with um, Food Standards Scotland's ambitions for improving the health of the Scottish population. What we've noted is that over the years, the Strategic Research Programme has perhaps focused more on innovation and um, mechanistic research in relation to diet and health. Um, whereas, I, th I guess, kind of going forward, we would like to see more focus on um, applied research, which is more around looking at the impact of interventions. I think in the Scottish Government obesity strategy, and Food Standards Scotland have recently articulated some quite ambitious goals in relation to changing the food landscape, possible regulatory interventions for improving dietary health, um, and there would be real scope, the expertise is in the institutes, and we would like to see better alignment and, and targeting of that expertise, maybe more towards um, looking at the, the impact of, of these interventions. Targeting and alignment stifle innovation? The, the points that, that were raised earlier about getting the, the balance right between um, looking at the kind of building of longer term um, research goals and, and building up the expertise and looking at um, shorter term policy needs. Um, I think getting that balance right is, is really important. Um, I think for us, it's all about engagement. Um, and having as a policy customer for, for the research that's undertaken, I think we've really welcomed the opportunities for collaboration. And I think going forward, having more involvement in um, developing um, the research programme and reviewing um, progress as it develops would be, be very welcome. But, but forgive me if I'm wrong here, as the customer, would you not be dictating what the research was? <coughs> Well, we would, we would appreciate the opportunity, I think, to have more input okay. into developing that. We do at the moment, but I think there's scope to build on that, on that further. OK, thanks. Colin Campbell. Yeah, I think there always is a bit of a tension between the sort of immediate needs and the long-term needs. Mm. And I think um, it's a bit of push and pull, I think, is the best option, actually. Um, you know, I mean, scientists at the James Hunt Institute, you know, love the opportunity of actually tr trying to solve a problem today. But it's also our job to think about what are the problems in the future. And, um, you know, if you take the food area, for example, Scotland builds its brand on high quality food. Um, and we've got a very ambitious programme, 2030 programme, around doubling the size of the sector. A lot of that's going to depend on small to medium sized enterprises. And a lot of that underpinning of that is going to be about the provenance, authentication and safety of food. So, for example, we've been thinking about ways in which we can actually de-risk that in the future. And some of the products from our long term research give us the, some of the best soils databases in the world. So we think we could, for example, come up with a, you know, a fabulous system for actually looking at the provenance and authentication of Scottish food, exploiting the cutting edge analytical techniques we have and the reference soils databases we have to put Scotland in an unrivaled position to protect the brand of Scotland's food and drink. You know, that's about long term thinking and it's about enabling that. And we've had some very good conversations with Food Standards Scotland around that. And it's about thinking ahead. And, you know, that sort of, that's the, the push from the scientists and you need a bit of the pull from the, the sector as well at the same time. Okay. Julie Fitzpatrick. I think it's possible to combine both aspects, the shorter term policy driven work with the longer term research. And of course, all of these outputs are driven by staff. So you need to be able to employ the staff with the expertise to deliver these. And they are one in the same group of people. Um, so I think that's really important that the short-term outputs come from people who are incredibly well um, educated in their subject matter and able to exploit a lot of the new technologies and new opportunities. So it is possible to combine the two, okay. but, but it is a, a, a two edges of the one coin, really. Okay, okay thanks. Let's move this on, Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks. <coughs> thanks, convener, and good morning to the panel. If I could uh, turn to the issue of... Uh, 
uh, centres of expertise and, and funding. Um, we've received a, a number of submissions which have mentioned issues relating to the, the annual funding, uh, and there's clearly um, a, a significant issue there. Uh, in particular, uh, we took evidence from uh, Climate Exchange, which highlighted annual funding, uh, which is creating deep uncertainty uh, for staff within uh, Climate Exchange, particularly those funded 100% uh, by, by uh, Climate Exchange. Uh, and it goes into some detail uh, given an, an example, including an issue of uh, redundancy notices having to be issued to the sec Secretariat on an annual basis, which, uh, which clearly is far from ideal. So um, could I ask uh, Ms Lowe to start with, uh, to, to tell us about the funding model for climate exchange, uh, the problems it can cause, and whether there are um, uh, the same issues for other centres of expertise? Um, well, uh so the answer to the last question of whether there are the same issues for the other centres of expertise is, is largely yes, and I'll come back to that. Um, the first five-year phase of our programme of climate exchange, we were in a slightly better position. We had a five-year budget, um, and although we did receive a letter, a grant letter annually from the Scottish Government, the size of that grant at each year point was already determined and agreed. So there was a, a much higher degree of certainty on the part of the institutions appointing and um, employing individuals working in, in climate exchange at that time. Since 2015-16 um, uh, financial year, we've been working again within a five-year envelope, but with the expectation that at each year point we might suffer a cut, and indeed that's happened. Um, so that obviously adds to the uncertainty and means that the institutions that are employing individuals in climate exchange, particularly in the Secretariat, but also the fellows who are uh, employed within um, universities, those institutions don't have that same degree of certainty um, and in spite of letters of comfort um, that might come, they are unwilling to, to take any risks and, and they're legally obliged to, to issue redundancy letters at six months and at three months before the end of the grant period. And that is obviously unsettling for people and it has meant um, that people inevitably might be looking for other uh, employment. In terms of the fellows themselves, so these are the uh, research fellows appointed at uh, universities. They have been in the past on five-year programmatic um, contracts. Uh, those, are, those tend to be two or three years now. And again, um, the uncertainty on year-on-year -year uncertainty means that it is difficult to um, attract the right people in the first place because research council funding tends to be much longer term and more stable. Um, so obviously if you're a young researcher coming out of a PhD with an option to work in climate exchange or do something else, you will think seriously about uh, taking the climate exchange option. So those are all problems, um, challenges that we, we understand. There may not be anything we can do about them, um, but we, we do our best to... Uh, particularly from the Secretariat perspective, to build relationships with Scottish Government funders um, who we understand you know, are working within a, a number of constraints um, and to work with our fellows to try to, to play up, if you like, the, the positive sides of working in climate exchange with the policy impact that that um, brings. In terms of the other centres of expertise, um, CRU, which is the centre of expertise on waters, has a slightly different model to ours and tends to rely a little bit more in terms of its overall budget on the research institutes. Um, and EPIC has, uh, the, the health, animal health um, uh, centre, has a, an issue a very, very similar to ours with the one year budgets and, and have, they raise that, I know that we do as well um, regularly. For the um, the annual awards affects all of the research programme, it's not just the centres. So there's same sort of planning constraints and retention recruitment constraints on the institutes generally. Could I comment? We, we are in this, uh, the same position. We just don't issue the redundancy notices. So if we were not able to receive our funding, we would have reserves to cover the redundancy period. But otherwise, it is a one-year contract. Okay, and I have a follow-up question, which I probably know the answer to already, but um, what can be done to reduce the problem uh, with regard to uh, the annual funding model? Um, much can be done at the moment, given the, the way that the budgets are set at national level. Um, as I say, we do, those of us working within the Secretariat and Climate Exchange, in terms of reaching out to our fellows, we do uh, 
as much as we can to, to reassure them that centre ex expertise is incredibly successful, as we, we all believe, and therefore it's unlikely to be pulled away completely um, at the drop of a hat. And, and so there is, um, unfortunately, no kind of cast iron guarantee, but there is a, a huge amount of um, respect for and, and support for the, for the centre. Um, so we have to kind of assume that that uh, is going to be enough to keep people, keep people on board and stop them from looking for other jobs. Good. Yeah. In, the, in the past, we had a five-year rolling programme, which was hugely valuable, actually, because the nature of other types of funding is usually one year or three years. And um, having a five-year programme allows you to be more ambitious about what you're going to do. And I think um, we maybe need to get out of this model of um, whether it's one year, three years or five years. There are some types of research, if we had a 10-year, and don't fall off your seats, if we, if we had a 10-year funding cycle, we could be even more ambitious about what we're trying to achieve because you can plan with certainty and you've got more flexibility to be excellent and creative in what you do. So it's not one size fits all, but we certainly need to get away from the one year. Um, it does constrain the way in which we, we think and plan ahead. Although governments learn their budget on an annual basis as no. well. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. <laughs> Stevenson. Um, just a little thing that comes out of what's being said here. Are the longitudinal models that we're relying on in certain areas at risk from short-term funding? Or is it really something that we're able to protect because they are the very long term? Yeah, I, I mean, this is where, really where I'm, I'm referring to things like 10-year contracts. We do a lot of long-term environmental change network type experiments where we're monitoring the environment over decadal patterns. We've got long-term sampling campaigns which might get a national data set in a, about a natural resource of Scotland such as the soils. You know, these need much longer time frames in which to actually operate and we potentially miss that if we're not having the ambition and the opportunity to have longer-term research. And what's different about institutes from many research providers is that we do do that long-term research. So it's why we have these national data sets of great value to us. It's why we have these longitudinal data sets which allow us to judge and put climate change in the context in which we can. And if we undermine that with short-term funding, we'll un inevitably undermine that unique selling point. Okay. I guess we can go on. Yeah, thanks. Um, before you move on, convener, um, there was uh, one submission from SWT which suggested that the, uh, there was a need for uh, a plant health centre of expertise. Um, now, the question is, would you be content to uh, see additional centres of expertise established, given that the funding would come from existing budgets? Yeah, yeah I think, yeah, I mean, a plant health centre would be very welcome and needed by the stakeholders in particular. Um, plant health would cover both agricultural crops and trees. If you take them together, they're actually a bigger sector than the livestock sector, and yet we have a, 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 plant, a health centre for livestock. Um, so I think we very much do need that. And I think there is scope for more centres of expertise. But I don't think we need a centre every time. We maybe need to embrace the principles and the models of the centre. It could be in a smaller way. It could be integrated into the research programme. I think there's a number of different ways of doing that. Um, but I'd like to recognise that Scottish Government have taken a lead here at a UK and European level. And others are looking at this model of centres. It's a very useful one, I think. But we need to keep on reviewing it and thinking of ways in which we can fulfil the principles of it without necessarily creating a big centre every time we've got a need. Looking at integration of the centres might be one uh, future way of um, exploring better integration and better delivery across even wider areas of policy relevance. Today, that, that there's a lot of smart thinking going on in the sector about collaborative working. But is there anything you're seeing from elsewhere in the world that, that we could adapt here and benefit from? I think the, the creation of Safari actually was partly the result of looking at other international models where research institutes, for example, have combined their efforts to have a common branding so that they can compete internationally. Um, and that's, that's an option for us now that we have Safari. We can actually think in those ways. So I think there's a, there has been other international models like that. And as I say, international science is all about collaboration and working together across, across borders. And um, you know, I think Safari gives us that option, and I think there's other examples that we could explore uh, along those lines. I think you wanted to come in there. Yeah, no, I just wanted to, to, to um, I suppose, reflect on the comment about integrating the centres. Um, from our perspective, what we do is, is bespoke, and we work with a number of policy teams in a very different way, perhaps, than other, the other centres do, and than um, Safari Gateway does. I think the other unique thing about the centres, and each does it differently, is the way in which they engage with the higher uh, education institutions, so universities. 
um, and that's something that uh, I think br you know brings a huge strength to the overall portfolio of research that, that RESAS funds. Okay, Mr Cook, you want to come in there? Perhaps worth um, turning this around to think about it from the perspective of the end user of this research and uh, what it's designed to do and so on. Um, and very early on, uh, Safari Gateway and the centres of expertise were talking about that. And we have a shared understanding that it's important that for people who might ultimately use this research, whether they're policy people or business people or farmers or um, individuals or so on, um, they're not particularly bothered who's funding what uh, or what constructs look like. They just uh, need the information and research and expertise uh, that's available to them. One of the things we're doing in Safari Gateway is developing a directory of expertise across Safari, uh, and some of those do link in and deliver some of the work that centres of expertise uh, deliver as well, to try and shine a light on that, to try and lift the lids on where this research funding is going. And all of these mechanisms are designed to uh, improve that flow of information, and we continue to work with the centres of expertise on that too. Okay, briefly, Stuart Stevenson. Are the academic journals as important as they used to be for the dissemination of information with the introduction? I think there's now open journals as well. Uh, are, are we playing our part in that? Yeah, very much so. We're, we're trying to address the sort of open access approach and become open science institutions. And there's a lot of new ideas around how we actually do that because it's fundamentally important that we open up and engage with all stakeholders and uh, with the public about understanding what we're trying to do without their support we're nothing and we need to make sure we've got that support. Academic journals are still incredibly important in terms of underpinning the excellence of the science and ensuring that it has been peer reviewed and that it is robust evidence. It, it was the same point. I mean everything that we do has got to be based on scientific rigour and international recognition of the work we do, otherwise it, its value is massively undermined. So it's really important that we hit um, outputs that are relevant to multiple different uh, audiences if we are to remain as relevant as we have been over the years. And I wonder if I could just add to the point about the, the collaboration. I think it is really important because there are now big consortia right across the world getting ready to work together to really address some of the, the Millennium and Sustainable <sighs> Development Goals. So you will know that the UK government are moving a lot of money into something called the Global Challenges Research Fund, which again is taking UK science and making sure that it's also impacting in poorer countries across the world. And I think that fits very well with the Scottish government's um, aims and objectives to take our science uh, created in Scotland and make sure that it has impact right across the different sectors that we, uh, we can influence. OK, thanks very much. Um, moving this on, Kate Forbes. Thanks very much. Um, in the written submission, um, Morden said that one criticism has been division of funding into a number of streams with insufficient thought as to how these might, might, might align with the main research provider skills base or meet the needs of policy makers and others. Is this something that um, other panel members agree with? And then a question to everybody, how would you better align funding streams? Sure, I'll take that one, Molly. Yeah. Um, I think to agree, yes, we would, would agree there's obviously competing demands for the research budget from a wider range of stakeholders, for example. That's not always going to necessarily align with the capability we have. And there's a tension there in the sense that we've got lots of ideas to explore the areas that we're currently strong in. And we have to recognise that there's going to be that diversity of demand from a wider range of stakeholders. But if, it, if you end up diluting it to the point that you're actually harming the core purposes of what we're actually doing, then there's a danger there, I think. And um, we need to be always thinking about how do we actually do deliver to these diverse stakeholders and their needs in the future. Um, but the more that we slice the cake, the more we're going to damage the integrity of the research we do. And I think there is a danger there. And it's again about balance and about the main focus of what we're actually trying to achieve. Uh, perhaps to the uh, point made earlier about overlap and so on, because one of the other things that uh, was mentioned in the Mordon uh, submission was that the way that the research is constructed there is designed so that it doesn't overlap with uh, other pieces of work happening elsewhere in the UK as well, and to try and um, help, I guess, fill in that, that patchwork of research that's required. So that's perhaps worth 
mentioning to. What a very pertinent points this morning. What mechanism, if any, exists for you to articulate these views, all of you to articulate these concerns to government? We've got a very, very good working relationship with RESAS, obviously. We talk to them on a regular basis. Uh, the creation of Safari has also allowed a new forum for actually talking to them in a more coordinated fashion. And um, we do raise all the, these issues on a, in sort of bilateral meetings and also in meetings with the, the Director's Executive Committee, which is a, a, a function of the Safari um, Collective. So we've got opportunities to raise these, but obviously, you know, we're we're supplying research. Um, Scottish government and RESAS are responding to the needs of a wide range of stakeholders, and I think it really comes back to this: what's it for? Um, you know, what is it we're actually trying to achieve? And for us, it's always been about the agriculture, the environment, and the food of Scotland. And the three things are fundamentally linked. And as a sector, it's incredibly important in Scotland. Probably more important in Scotland than it is in England and Wales, for example. And it's, you know, how much do you want to dilute that to look at other things? And I would argue we don't, not at the moment. Um, there's too many opportunities and there are too many risks from Brexit, climate change, etc., to dilute that by spending on things outside of that original purpose. Okay. Re returning to the original question, sorry. Uh, Julie Fitzpatrick, do you want to... Yes, really just to say, um, I, I think what we have to do is, is choose to be excellent in... Uh, a specified number of areas. So it's really important that our research programmes are co-constructed with stakeholders, with government and with the scientists as well, so that we, we make the best of all of the expertise that we have. But if we have reducing budgets, again, we've got to be able to change course, we've got to be able to do less in some areas and perhaps focus more on some new areas which are coming through. And I think it's very important that we have that flexibility to allow us to manage our resources as best we can over these these next few years, which I think are going to be particularly challenging with the uncertainty about EU funding, although obviously some more positive messages uh, coming out recently. Okay. Graeme Cook. Perhaps just to give a quick example of how that might show itself, um, we've been working with Food Standards Scotland to try and develop a safari fellowship to look at a, an issue which is front and centre now, but might not have been so much at the time that the current strategic research programme was being developed. Um, and that's to uh, look at uh, the resilience of the food supply, uh, the food chain in Scotland. And obviously there are uh, practical and research uh, issues which relate to that, but there are also political issues as well, uh, which uh, were not uh, in place in relation to um, the UK leaving the European Union and so on. So that's an area that we've uh, identified collectively as something that we can offer the safari research as a platform to uh, open up and examine, um, and we'll be looking to work with Food Standards Scotland over the next few months on that. Okay, good. Yeah, just to follow on from what Graham was saying and going back to the original question as to how we could change things for the better going forward, as I alluded to from our perspective, and we are maybe slightly different from other policy customers within Scottish Government as we're a non-ministerial office, but for us it's, it's, it's about an awareness of the expertise. There's a significant amount of expertise in the institutes. I mean, it's a, a world-leading resource that, that we have here. And it's about us understanding how that expertise can address some of our key policy questions. I think when you look at food and drink, if you look at the Ambition 2030 about growing the, the industry, it's about innovation. But it's also about supporting businesses, predominantly SMEs, who maybe don't have a lot of technical expertise in being able to meet the challenges in terms of compliance, meeting standards for trade um, arrangements, um, verifying the authenticity of, of the food chain. And, and Colin provided a really good example earlier on of how we're trying to explore some of the expertise that's grown up over the years and how we can use that in a different way, in a way that's really going to, to support the food and drink industry in Scotland. And that's why I think it's, it's from our perspective, it's all about engagement and platforms for, for improving that engagement um, with the institutes. And, and Safari's a, a great example of that. Um, we've had some 
really good examples over the past couple of years, um, commissioning work with the Morden through the, the Contract Research Fund, which has been hugely successful for us in, in addressing a, a, a key food safety issue um, for us, the, the work that, that Graham's just described through the, the Safari Fellowship. And these are all about collaboration and engagement with the, the, the policy customers for the research. And I think that's going to be increasingly important going forward. Okay, Kate Forbes, you want to develop this one? Um, just it's a slight um, sidestep on funding. Again, there was a few comments in the written submissions about the funding balance between underpinning capacity to maintain long-term data sets, um, producing high-quality science, and also rapidly responding to emerging societal challenges. Do you think that balance is correct at the moment? It, it varies with the different organisations because we do different types of science and certainly at the Mordan we get a, a bigger proportion of our funding for underpinning capacity because it, it doesn't just focus on the outputs, it focuses on the employment and the activity of the people doing the work. So working in the laboratories, handling the, the pathogens, um, working with the animals in, in our particular case. So it's not just about the databases or the outputs or the contributions into the programme. It's the fact that Scotland has a number of capabilities within the organisations, uh, right across the Safari organisations, which are created by that underpinning capacity. So as the name suggests, really the rest of the work is not possible without the support of that, that work which goes on on a daily basis to um, support all of the research programmes and indeed contributions to the centres of expertise as well. So just to pick up on that point, what does your recent tie up with SRUC, which looks very interesting, bring to the table? Yes, we're, we're, we're really, uh, we're really d delighted about that. Our interactions with SRUC go back many years, uh, particularly in the area of surveillance and SRUC are co-locating onto the Morden site, which means the three providers of animal surveillance in Scotland will all be in the same building, the third being the APHA, the Animal and Plant Health Agency. So it does make a lot of sense for us to co-locate, uh, share equipment, and also to have that interaction between staff. But the CEO of, of SRUC, uh, Professor Powell, and I have also discussed how we can bring our science closer together both in terms of R&D and our knowledge exchange. But it isn't because of overlap. It's, it's, it's the opposite, really. Mm. Um, over so the you complement each we're other. We're complementing yeah. because SRUC tend to do welfare and genetics. We do a lot on animal disease. So we do see it as a, a multiple win for all the organisations involved. OK, thanks. Colin Campbell. Yeah, I mean, to answer your question, I don't think we should be cutting back on underpinning capacity in these areas any more than we have, actually. This is fundamentally the flexible creative area that we can actually be innovative. And innovation is really the, the name that's been used by everybody from across the world to Europe. Europe have just created a new innovation council. We need that flexibility to be innovative. And we also, it funds national capability. So having the ability to uh, analyse samples from across Scotland has been used in a number of events and emergencies. So, for example, the James Hutton Institute did work on the MV Brayer disaster when the tanker ran aground in the Shetland. We did all the hydrocarbon analysis for that. Um, we were involved in Chernobyl. Um, we were involved in the recent volcanic uh, eruption, which created a potential for pollution of Scottish waters, which didn't come to anything, thankfully. But that national capability is needed to deal with events and disasters, and it's part of Scotland's resilience in dealing with that. The national capability also allows us to support other industries. And many of the techniques, for example, that we actually use for um, doing chemical analysis actually support other industries in Scotland out with the agriculture, environment and food sector. We're, we're a fundamental part of the national capability of Scotland. Okay. Kate Forbes, you have any other points? Yeah, I'm fine. Yes. Okay. Can, can I just ask uh, on this subject, um, more than you've been critical of the reporting mechanism um, uh, around it, saying that it's complex and time-consuming, cumbersome and resource-consuming. Can, can someone give us an example of what that is in practice? The, there has been increased emphasis in reporting, I think particularly in the past 12 months, um, possibly over the last two years, and it has been due to auditing purposes. So it is a, a time-consuming process that we have to set our 
objectives of research in different parts of the programme, um, which, which is fine, you would expect to do that for any research contractor, but the frequency of updating the reporting is, it, it is very uh, intense and it is taking a considerable amount of staff time. I suppose at the moment when resources are short, I would prefer to have a lighter touch. That's not because I don't approve of auditing. I just feel that it's uh, an excessive use of staff time, uh, which could be perhaps better employed in innovative research. Is that echoed across the panel? Yeah, I think we all recognise there's a greater need for accountability, especially for public money. And, um, you know, this is a, a significant amount of public money. So we need to be accountable for that. And we have been accountable for that in the past and shown that we've given very good value for money. But, you know, the, you know there are sort of potentially thousands of research deliverables within a sort of five-year framework that have to be accounted for. That does create its sort of um, transaction costs. Um, and we see that with other funders as well. And again, what's really important about the Scottish Government research funding is it, it, it gives us this flexibility and ability to actually lever money from other funders in the future. If everybody's sort of auditing and accounting in great detail, you stifle creativity. And I think you, you count against excellence in science as well, because you've not got the time in which to be creative and excellent. In layman's terms, I mean, has the reporting requirement doubled, tripled, quadrupled? What is it? I think it's a substantial increase. I mean, we have tried to measure it in full-time equivalents of staff, and we make it about one and a half full-time staff. Those are senior members of staff, so that's a significant uh, contribution of our staff cohort uh, to reporting. So that's the annual time that's dedicated yeah. to this process? Yeah. Okay. Is that, on a, is that on a weekly basis or a monthly basis? It or? is on a... We do a weekly update, and then it's transferred through a number of different systems to the final reporting. It's quite a complex system, but, but and again, you know, it, it, it perhaps does need to be quite extensive because there are many art, uh, research deliverables, many different parts of the programme, but it's just whether or not it could perhaps be, be um, lightened up slightly to just release more time, is essentially, to, to do the work. Colin Campbell. Yeah, I, mean, I think, I mean, what I've seen about the kind of reporting and auditing approach is that it can result in better project management in some circumstances. Uh, and I think that's entirely good for everybody in that respect. I think RESAS are, are aware of some of these issues and are thinking more flexibly about how you don't treat everything the same. Again, there are mm -hmm. some areas which we could be lighter touch, for example, and other areas where actually there's a pressing and urgent need, therefore we need more accountability. So it's being looked at? So it, it is being looked at, but I think, you know, we've, we've started on this process. I think it's not one size fits all. We need to have a more flexible approach. And certainly for excellent creative science, we need less. Thank you for that. Uh, Mark Roscoe. Thanks. Um, can I turn to the issue of uh, management of buildings and research facilities? So we had some written evidence from the Royal Botanic Gardens, and I think they identified a maintenance backlog of £15 million amongst their assets. What, what, what kind of uh, challenges do you have in terms of asset management in relation to the budgets? Yeah, so for the James Hunt Institute, it's quite considerable. Um, you know, we've um, previously benefited from uh, capital investment from Scottish Government. So in 2011, for example, we would get uh, a grant of £3 million for capital. That, that last year declined to 100000 and that's been a significant challenge. Uh, we also have an ageing um, capital infrastructure, particularly at our Invergowrie site, uh, where there are up to 40 different buildings, uh, none of them in a modern state, probably the last one built in 1990s. Um, so it's a considerable challenge. Uh, we recognise that the James Hunt Institute, that's partly, that is our problem, and we've got to solve that problem. And we've come up with some progressive ideas about how do we actually seek alternative sources of capital investment. Uh, we've submitted two um, significant proposals to this Taste City deal, for example, to ad partly address those issues, but partly also to create new innovation centres which will actually increase revenue uh, from other alternative sources of funding. But it is a significant concern and it does affect retention and recruitment of world-class scientists. They all want to work in the best possible facilities, and if we, we don't pay attention to this, we will um, suffer as a result. If I could comment, um, Morden Research Institute has received no capital grants from Scottish Government for many years now, but we're in a fortunate position that our land and buildings are owned by the Morden Foundation which is one of Scotland's largest charities. It has 14,000 
paying members. They pay a very small fee every year to be part of our foundation, but they actually own the assets, which are insured for about £25 million. And um, so this is a facility um, at the Easterbush um, estate just south of Edinburgh. Uh, so we're in a different position that, um, that our model uh, allows the facilities to be maintained out with the Scottish Government budgets. Sustainable in the in the long run. I think it is because our foundation has created two major commercial subsidiaries, which are profit making, but there are no shareholders. So when the profits are generated, then the money is gifted back to the foundation and gifted back into the research institute. So it's a recycling of profit. So I think it's sustainable as long as the commercial subsidiaries are sustainable, which of course is always a, a different question, but we're, we're confident at the moment. Um, but it, it is incredibly important that the facilities are maintained, um, especially, dare I say, at those facilities that are handling um, animal or human pathogens, because you have to be completely um, in line with all of the um, legislative aspects of handling those organisms. I think earlier on you mentioned about co-location uh, buildings at SRUC. Is that has that been a smooth process, or are there other issues there? SRUC obviously having a very different asset management model to your own. It, it, it is going well. It's it's still underway at the moment, but we're confident that it will go through. Um, and I think it shows that there are lots of different models that one can take. There are appropriate areas of science where co-location is is an ideal situation. Other types of science can be done remotely. I mean, we we can work with scientists right across the world, so we can certainly work in dispersed models as well, but certainly co-location for very specific facilities um, can be quite useful. Um, this is maybe one example uh, of where uh, it's clear that the institutes which make up Safari are different in relation to the facilities and the assets that they hold, uh, and the challenges uh, across those are, uh, are, are, are different as well. And it may be that we could perhaps write back to the committee with a bit more detail on each of the institutes setting out uh, the position. Um, but one thing I did want to mention is that Safari Gateway, as a route to uh, improving that information flow is also looking at uh, developing a kind of asset register across Safari with a view to thinking about how could we improve access to the facilities which already exist across the Safari Institutes so that they could be utilised um, better and more appropriately and by other actors. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I think it's uh, important to, to recognise that um, investment in the asset base in the BBSRC institutes has been quite substantial recently. Um, I mean, over in the last five years, over £380 million pounds have been invested in BBSRC institutes, some of which are in Scotland, which is great. Um, but there's a recognition that you need to d develop that asset base if you're going to remain world-class and competitive. Um, we haven't seen that in other parts of Scottish uh, research. Uh, and I think it is a real concern for me that we, we haven't seen that level of capital investment to maintain infrastructure at a world-class level. Mm -hmm. But just to be clear, you're talking about private sector investment. Has there been discussion with the Scottish Government about you know, capital the, investment in your, in your assets? Uh, you know, clearly, there are constraints around capital investment um, from the public sector. Um, but the BBSRC is a public sector organisation of the UK Government and has invested mm -hmm. in these research institutes. Most of them are in England and Wales, so there are some in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, that's UK government money that's been invested there. And there's a recognition that you need to invest in that asset base. I mean, some of those institutes are also becoming more independent of government, but there's a recognition that you need to leave them, let them go with a properly invested asset base. Mm -hmm. But has there been discussion with the Scottish Government about yep. increasing the funding? Yeah, you talked about three, three million pounds dropping to 100,000. Is that, is that fixed now? Or? No, in fact, then this year, in fact, it's, it's gone back up to 600,000. And they will always invest where they, they own the land in Vigauri, for example, okay. and they will always invest where there's any issues about compliance, health and safety, for example. Um, but that's not the same as developing the asset base in terms of the world-class infrastructure that we need for doing science. And they are indeed the first investors in the Tay City deals. They've, um, they've invested money there to allow us to do the business case and the feasibility studies. I'm very grateful for that. But the, you know, the level of investment we need is much, much larger than RESAS has as a, as a capital fund, for example. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we've had to seek alternative sources of funding. 
Um, and the, the Tay City deal, for example, is a perfect opportunity where we can bring sort of public and private partnerships together to try and get that investment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mark, you have further questions? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, let's move this on. Uh, Donald Cameron. Thank you. Thank, thank you to the panel for coming today. Um, I've got a series of questions for Safari in particular. Um, I think you receive approximately 750,000 from um, the strategic research portfolio. Um, without asking you to sing for your supper too much, could you explain what you are doing now that wasn't um, happening before? Yes, uh, certainly. So uh, I've talked a little about the directory of expertise, and that is one thing which we do, which underpins uh, a lot of the other work which we're uh, seeking to deliver as well. We have a, a staff base which is drawn from across the institutes, and that's useful because it brings in expertise uh, from across each of the institutes, but with different sectoral capabilities. So the idea is that they know what's going on in their different areas uh, across the research programme, and they can uh, link that back into uh, stakeholders as well. They understand that landscape too. In terms of what that money funds, it funds uh, the staff time of those individuals that I've talked about, as, uh, as well as me and a core team uh, of our secretariat. Um, we have three main elements that we fund on a uh, competitive basis. Uh, one of those uh, is uh, the Safari Think Tank. Uh, this is a mechanism which allows individuals across the research institutes to take a step back from their day-to-day -day work and think about national and global challenges. Uh, we've got five uh, programmes running at the moment. Uh, one uh, is on something called the systematic review of sustainability assessments of cities from a food systems perspective. What does that mean? It means urban food and how we produce it and how we can do it better and how we can measure it and so on. We've got other pieces of work around um, uh, conserving genetic diversity. So that's considering the diversity of uh, crops, of forestry, uh, agricultural resources across Scotland to ensure we've got resilience in Scotland uh, and ensuring that Scotland hits uh, its targets, its international uh, uh, targets, uh, known as the HE uh, targets on biodiversity. We've got work looking at um, how we can think about decarbonising global agri-foods, where can carbon budgets have a place to play in um, the agri-food uh, network. And we've got a couple of projects looking at um, alternative protein sources. So this is thinking about uh, perhaps crops which we haven't used so much in Scotland and colleagues are able, would be able to talk more about the specifics of those. So that's the think tank mechanism, five programmes running under that. We've got something called the Responsive Opportunity Fund, um, and I'll go into less detail, but suffice to say we've got 13 projects running under that, and that allows researchers across Safari a mechanism to carry out knowledge exchange on their research, which they wouldn't ordinarily or otherwise have had the opportunity to do. Uh, some of the high-profile things under that include development of a cross-Safari film at the John Hope Gateway, um, at the, at the uh, Botanic Garden in Edinburgh. Um, we've done other things uh, around holding workshops. Uh, we've done things like farmer-to-farmer -farmer peer learning around um, mechanisms called precision agriculture. This is about vaccinating livestock in the right way at the right time to ensure that the systems are more efficient and so on. Uh, we've got school soil posters and so on. So we've got a mix of things under that fund. Uh, uh, the third main funded element is fellowships. Um, we've run two of those so far, one with Scotland's Futures Forum, which members will know is, is, is wholly owned by the Scottish Parliament. And we worked with them looking at Scotland's culture and society to 2030. But we had the conversation initially uh, suggesting that in order to have a well-functioning culture and society, you need a well-functioning, resilient environment. And we were able to bring a fellow in to bring the safari research to bear on that conversation. Um, the second fellowship which we've run was with Cairngorms National Park Authority. Um, and this was looking at upland moorland management. And this was very interesting because it came out of a 
meeting which we had between researchers working on issues in the Cairngorms or which could be relevant to the Cairngorms and the Cairngorms National Park Authority, they had a meeting with the National Park Authority and that was very interesting and saw um, information exchanged and so on. But we recognised there was potential to do more with that and we funded a fellowship um, to explore how the distance between that research and decision uh, makers within the park could be shortened. And we, uh, we had an individual um, from the Morden Institute who was able to go and talk to land managers, land owners, land practitioners in the upland moorland area to talk to them about what their issues were. Um, and interestingly, we found ourselves, this was an iterative process, we found ourselves being a, a knowledge broker for uh, people whose voice might not ordinarily be heard in these sorts of situations. I'm talking about gamekeepers as kind of land managers in their own right. And we're developing that work based on what they told us their issues were in relation to some of the, um, uh, the issues they have to deal with uh, day to day on the ground. And this was a, a little bit of a light bulb moment, I suppose, in that um, we can talk about research in the abstract and with organisations and so on, but it has to get to the people who might ultimately be able to use it in practical ways for it to work properly. So those are the, the funded mechanisms. So thank you for that very comprehensive answer. And um, developing the point that you mentioned last and referring back to your comment about the rest and be thankful um, past, which is an issue dear to my heart, uh, representing the Highlands and Islands. Um, so how do you take that kind of um, issue and actually um, affect policy thereafter. So how do you plug into Transport Scotland in that instance or, or local authorities? Um, I think you've hit the nail on the head by saying that we can plug into conversations which are already happening. We're not looking to reinvent the wheel. We are trying to demonstrate where the safari research is um, relevant to uh, topics which are ongoing. So I've talked about the example with Food Standards Scotland, for example. Um, we're also talking to SNH. We're talking to Loch Lomond and Trostix National Park Authority. We're talking to Scotland Food and Drink. So it's across that spectrum of, of things which are happening. We know we've got work to do, and it's an iterative process, identifying where within government and so on the right policy leads and conversations have to take place and how we can help that. But in my mind, the um, catchment um, uh, analogy, I suppose, is a useful way of thinking about it. Um, I, uh, I am able to work in a forestry commission office, actually, uh, for a day a week. And the conversations that they have are ex exactly the same as the challenges we face in terms of if you look at a hill, there's lots of land managers involved on that hill. How do you design a construct and a conversation that can bring them all together? So the rest and be thankful is one area where we might be able to do a mapping exercise to say who's involved here. Um, but it's also an area where we've been looking to link up terrestrial research, I suppose, with what's going on in the marine environment as well. And there's lots of publicly funded research going on there too, and that interaction, interaction is important. I ask lastly, um, obviously Safari is relatively new um, and you represent uh, or coordinate a number of very well-known brands such as Morden or the James Hutton Institute and others here, here today. Um, are you clear in your mind when Safari as a brand should be used or when um, these well-known sort of um, uh, and relatively long-standing um, names that we all know should be used instead? And where, where's the balance between between Safari and, and, and the house of brands, as, as you might otherwise be? Yeah, I mean, that, that's been an interesting exercise, actually, to get to the point where the Safari uh, Collective uh, was established. And you're absolutely right. Uh, all these institutes um, have world-leading and well-renowned and long-standing um, reputations in their own right. Um, our view would be that... Um, there are different horses for courses with this, and we've got agreement at the director's executive committee level, uh, at which Julie and Colin and the directors of the other institutes and myself all sit, um, that we 
believe that the Safari uh, brand can be used in relation to the strategic research programme, but also in relation to other government funding uh, and also other funding which is able to be levered in with a recognition that the Scottish Government funding for research is absolutely fundamental to this work. Um, the point at which it stops um, it probably relates to commercial activities which the individual institutes would carry out. Um, but I would say this is also an iterative process for us and we've been working very hard with the communications teams of all the institutes to try and build capacity and a shared understanding of when the Safari brand is appropriate and uh, when individual institutes should uh, look to uh, look to their own reputations and sorry just to um, widen that to the other institutes I mean very briefly given the time but in, in terms of your um, role as part of Safari do you have any brief comments to make sorry. Um, I, I would like to to uh, agree with Graham I, I think it is uh, and, and the point that that you made I, I think it's it's a good name it's a good acronym we like what it stands for it is a house of brands and I think we have to use it as and where it is appropriate. You know, when we're working with our international collaborators who've known the, the name Mordan for, you know, many, many decades, we continue to use the name Mordan, but we, we always refer back to Safari as our Scottish initiative, trying to bring everything together. So I think it's all about interpretation, and I think it has been a very useful addition to the way we describe our work. So do you want to come? Yeah, I, I would agree entirely, actually. We've got uh, multiple levels at which we work at Scottish, European, global level. James Hunt brand has been very quickly established and has got great resonance with people already. Um, but Safari also is working incredibly well for us, particularly at a Scottish level. You have toes in any way? No, no. Right. no. It's actually very helpful. We've had a great response from stakeholders who like it very much. They see a one-stop shop, which is a great place to come. Excellent. Right. Richard Lyle. Morning. Um, I've got two questions. Uh, first one is in regard to the National Performance Framework, and Mr Campbell actually touched on this um, subject earlier. The Scottish Government website states the Scottish Government is investing around £48 million a year into a portfolio of strategic research to ensure that Scotland maintains its position at the very cutting edge of advances in agriculture, food and in the environment. In your opinion, does the panel agree that this money has been well spent? Short answer. Yeah, yes, the short answer is yes, but I'll, I'll expand on that for you. I mean, I think uh, there is tremendous evidence here. I mean, just in terms of a, you know, the economic strategy of Scotland, we're making a, a big contribution to that. You know, I mean, Julie and I have both talked about the multipliers that we give back, you know, anywhere between 10, 12. Uh, pound 75 for every pound invested. Uh, that, that's creating wealth, creating jobs. In our case, for every job at James Hutton, there's another six jobs. Um, so we're fundamentally contributing to the economic strategy of Scotland. Over and above that, we're also contributing to many, many, many policy areas in terms of climate change. I, I think many of the progressive policies we have, for example, in Scotland are built on the sound evidence that we've provided over decades. Um, you know, the ability to actually calculate how much carbon is in the soil is only possible because we've ma mapped those um, soils across all of Scotland. So I think we're making lots of contributions there. We even contributed in two um, national performance indicators. So Scotland's one of the first nations in the world to have a natural asset uh, register on a national asset uh, index so that we can actually follow what's happening with our natural capital in, in Scotland. So we've been world leading in terms of policy because we've got the science and the research there. And that there, I think there's multiple areas where we've made a contribution, everything from water framework directive um, through to climate change, for example, people and restoration doing a huge amount in that area as well. So I think there's, uh, you'll see in the evidence we've submitted many, many areas uh, you know, we even make a, a contribution to criminal justice through developing world-leading soil forensic methodologies to help solve crimes in Scotland. So I think we, we do a huge range there, and I think we give great value for money. If I could, could comment, I, I, I would agree. Um, I, I think uh, Scotland is, is internationally renowned for this area of science, for the, the work that's undertaken in food, agriculture, the environment and rural communities. And we have had major impact, as, as Colin has said, 
Over the years, um, at work at Morden has produced most of the vaccines that are used in at livestock health across the world. These vaccines are still selling many, many decades after the work uh, was conducted, and it's similar with uh, things like genetics, uh, both of animals and of fruit and vegetables in Scotland. So we've got a, a massive international recognition for the work we've done. And I think, in a way, that's part and parcel of the fact that the Scottish Government has supported us over a very large uh, number of years. And perhaps that hasn't happened across other uh, parts of the world so well. So we have actually been able to build up some really internationally competitive organisations. And that has allowed us to create spin-out companies and to commercialise our work, uh, which, again, we've got many examples of over the years. Campbell and Mark Roscoe, do you have a brief supplementary? Yeah, it was just on, on the, the, the work on climate change. I mean, can I ask specifically how has your research informed some of the policy choices within the draft climate plan? I was thinking in particular, you know, soil testing, for example. Um, yeah, so, I mean, one of the issues about soil testing is that we can probably manage our soils better for increasing the amount of carbon that we store in our soils. And the soil pH is one of the critical factors that we can potentially manage. So we're actually doing research to ensure that we are... At, that, that is absolutely possible. Um, all the sort of theory and scientific evidence to date suggests that actually would be of great benefit, but we also need to be absolutely sure that's the case. So the current research programme has a number of field experiments that is aimed at actually proving that is the case, that by monitoring and controlling the soil pH, we'll actually get climate change benefit from that. So it's about providing the evidence for the policies, but it's also about providing the logic and the thinking behind why we might actually undertake some of these specific actions which would benefit climate change. And that's true of peatland restoration as well. Okay. Uh, a lot of groundwork there. OK, Julie Fitzpatrick. Another example, I think, is the work that we do will help to meet some of the climate change targets, particularly in agriculture. So some of the targets um, involve better efficiencies in primary agricultural production. So that means, from a livestock point of view, being better at breeding animals, so they're more efficient and they have higher birth rates. And also by controlling some of our endemic or production diseases, we improve the efficiency of production. So that minimises input resources and maximises the outputs, which, again, we can now measure the impact of our control of these diseases in terms of carbon units. So we do see that the translation of this work will be very important as we address agricultural emissions. Um, so obviously, Climate, climate Exchange as a centre of expertise on climate change has been heavily involved in um, working with government on the draft climate change plan, energy strategy and many other things. Um, just thinking particularly about the, the purview of this committee and the um, environment, food and agriculture, uh, the work that we've done has been around um, looking at the the actual realisable, if you like, <clears throat> uh, t uh, carbon abatement you can achieve from different agricultural interventions as opposed to what the technical potential might be to help inform um, the, the carbon envelopes around agriculture and get those as, as right as possible. We've been working on um, forestry also and looking at ways in which the, the land use models can be integrated with the Times model, which, as you know, the Scottish Government used to generate some of the insights into, into the climate change plan. Um, so that's something that um, climate change has been heavily involved with for a, a long period of time. Okay. Thank you. Richard Lyle, your second question. Uh, lastly, uh, basically, is there any other um, piece of research in your field that would contribute to delivery of national outcomes of the Scottish Government's purpose? I saw uh, a few... Months ago, a, a piece in regard to concern about the loss of topsoil. Um, basically, is there any other research across the, the panel's opinion that, that needs to be done? Yeah, I think there are, there's quite a wide range of issues. I mean, uh, soil erosion, for example, is something that farmers are, are increasingly aware of. Um, you know, intensive agricultural production sometimes don't favour the... Um, the retention of soil after extreme events and rainfall events, and we've seen some spectacular examples of that over the countryside. Um, and I think that that's one particular issue that maybe does need to be looked at. Um, I think there are probably other areas as well, and I think um, in terms of policy-driven areas, for example, the, the Good Food Nation Bill, which is not just about food, it's also about uh, climate change uh, and about societal cohesion and all sorts of other things. I think there's lots of scope to do more research in that area as well. I could mention uh, Scotland Food and Drink's um, Ambition 2030 to double the turnover of that sector by 2030, I think is a fantastic 
uh, opportunity, but it will require primary agricultural production to match its aspirations. And I, I think it's very important that um, Safari continues to work to deliver technologies which is going to allow that to happen. And I'd like to make particular mention of upland and, and hill regions, some of the remote and rural communities in Scotland, where I do believe that they will have to remain active in food production and in providing a number of public services in order to support the um, Scotland Food and Drink Ambition and, of course, the new agricultural uh, strategy which will be created by the UK but which Scotland will have an opportunity to influence for our benefit. Okay. Can, I, can I just pick up on that point because I think we've taken other evidence uh, around this issue about um, the development of such policy but there's possibly a disconnect between creating that, that information and ha having it and actually having it implemented. Are you conscious of that? Uh, not, not especially. I think there's, I mean, the, the things you don't know what, what future questions and policies you, you might need. And uh, a lot of the approach of the Research Institute is to take a long term view and build up fundamental knowledge and understanding around how do we manage our systems, how do we quantify them. And that, that's a very useful basis for anything we might do in the future. I guess, so I guess what this, I'm getting at yeah. is, 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 is the agricultural sector hungry for this information and uh, ready to implement it? Absolutely. And, um, and they've got great need. I mean, they're under a lot of pressure at the moment from all sorts of things, and there's a great need for actual information and knowledge. And there's also great opportunity in sort of what's known as agri-tech now, tremendous innovations. I mean, one of the things we're doing at the James Sutton Institute is around vertical indoor farming, which is about growing. <laughs> vertical indoor farming is using a, a convergence of technologies, um, photonics, this is tunable LED lights, robotics, artificial intelligence, energy management systems to grow food crops inside of a vertical tower. And this is very, very aligned with Scotland because actually the two things you need is renewable energy and abundant, high quality water. And uh, you know, this is potentially a disruptive technology. There's new industries that could be getting born here uh, in the next few years. And Scotland needs to be aware of that and how it fits in with our, our existing agricultural, environmental and food ambitions. OK. Uh, Julie Fitzpatrick. I think it is very important that um, that the communities take very seriously about the implementation of strategy and I think there's really good evidence from National Farmers Union Scotland and Quality Meat Scotland in the areas that we particularly impact that people are taking research outputs very seriously indeed adopting new technologies and, and getting ready I think for that productive efficiency but also at maintaining the, the environment through uh, a number of different strategies. So I think there is evidence of it happening but knowledge exchange mechanisms need to stay in place to make sure that implementation does occur and again I think Safari takes those those, those pipelines from research all the way through to the end user very seriously indeed. Okay. Uh, John Scott, please. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Day is right. We have heard um, queries about this ability to uh, disseminate knowledge from our various research institutes, and I know the Morden already does that. Um, Graham or, or Colin, do you see opportunities for further developing that um, knowledge transfer model, perhaps you know, roadshows, or how might you see that happening? Because there is undoubtedly a need for greater knowledge to be disseminated to our... Yeah, very much so. And um, Safari Gateway is here to build on knowledge exchange mechanisms which already happen. So in terms of roadshows and so on, Mordon and SREC already do a lot of that type of work with farmers on the ground and so on. One of the things that we can do is bring the strengths that the different institutes have uh, to bear on the wider collective. So um, the Botanic Gardens, for example, have a particular model of engagement with wider society and so on. And they're able to uh, bring people into their gardens, into their sites, uh, but also to take their message out into the community and so on in relation to um, gardening and those sorts of things. But there's a lot of work to do here. And when you start to um, design a matrix that looks at what, are, what is happening across the research program and what does the business policy and society audiences actually look like. It starts to get complicated quite quickly, which is why it's important for us in Safari Gateway to try and prioritise around some of these key issues, which we know are drivers for government and for individuals as well, around climate change, around the idea of good food nation, um, but also bearing in mind that um, there are 
um, uh, issues which transcend these in, in relation to um, European Union questions and so on that we've talked about already. So there's lots of mechanisms, and I've described some of those that we are funding, but that's building on what's already happening as well. Okay. So the Jameson Institute has actually done this for a very long time. We've actually been a, have many award-winning ideas around how do you reach out to the general public and talk about science. And, um, and even some of the research that we've done is, and education that we've done has been embedded in the um, curriculum for excellence, for example. We've got exam questions and materials used for various subjects in schools. Um, but I think we can do a lot more of that. And I think Safari represents an opportunity for that. So we can join up together, do it more efficiently, share materials and ideas, and, and reach out to, the, to people much more effectively than we have in the past. Thanks so much. Your open days at Invergeri are always very interesting. Yeah, good fun. Well, yes, yeah. quite. Um, David Stewart. Thank you, Convener. Uh, what effect is Brexit having on your ability to attract and retain top quality scientists? So, I mean, there's a lot of concern around this. Uh, we've got something like 12% of our staff are uh, citizens from other European states. Um, and uh, that maybe doesn't sound like a huge number, but actually it's had a big impact on all of our scientists and uh, staff because there's concern about what's going to happen with, uh, with Brexit. And uh, I have to say we've probably only lost maybe two members of staff who have specifically said they're going back to Europe for those reasons. And I'm very sorry they've gone. They're excellent scientists. Um, but we haven't seen you know, any massive turnover of staff yet. Um, but it is having a big emotional effect on staff, actually. They, they want to feel welcome. Um, they've come to Scotland because we've got a high-quality environment uh, and we do world-class science. Um, anything that affects that is going gonna, is gonna to change things in the future and we need to be very careful about that. Um, Brexit also has an impact on funding, potentially, although I think things are calming down a little bit on that. Uh, certainly up until 2020, and thank goodness, because it's an area where we've been very successful and want to continue to be successful. But it's not just about the money. It's actually about the scientific cooperation. It's the opportunity to do a scientific experiment in Scotland and compare it against a scientific experiment in Spain or Germany. You learn a great deal more from that than you would if you were doing it on your own. So it's really important we keep that international cooperation going. And particularly in relation to advice and information and sharing of expertise, we also need to, I, I would suggest, keep involved in all the expert advisory groups so that we're sharing international knowledge around key issues such as disease threat and climate change. We have about 14% of our staff are in the same category, so we have the similar concerns. We haven't lost any yet, uh, but many of our PhD students are from EU countries, and they're a really important resource for us for future um, succession planning um, and just for, for uh, building up our science uh, knowledge. Our EU funds at the moment represent about a fifth of our income into the Morden Research Institute, and that's because we've been really successful. We've held two nine million euro grants over the last four or five years, one finished, one halfway through, so we will be able to uh, finish that uh, project as a, an EU coordinator. But it's losing that opportunity to do it in the future, which is significant. And obviously, it's very important then that we try to find other funds, hopefully again from the EU, if the UK uh, come to some arrangement that we can access those funds. But if not, we need to continue to try and find alternative sources of external funding. Although not a research institute, I think you've got quite a substantial um, uh, EU national presence. Well, yeah, there are a number of implications, I think, with EU exit in relation to um, protection of the food and drink industry in, in Scotland. We discussed, you know, the ambition 2030 and, you know, I, I pointed out earlier the importance of, of making sure, you know, innovation is important, but making sure that we don't forget the implications in relation to protecting the safety and the provenance of the Scottish food chain. All of these things are only going to become more important in a post-EU exit landscape when we're exploring new trade deals. There might be new regulatory standards to comply with, new methods that might have to be developed to demonstrate these standards, and also the value that's placed on the safety and provenance of the Scottish food and drink industry. It's, it's worldwide reputation we're talking about here, and I think there's huge opportunity within the, the institutes and the, and the programme to support these challenges going forward of abattoir workers and vets. Oh, absolutely, uh, yes. That's, a, that's another um, key consideration for, for Food Standards Scotland in relation to the delivery of official controls. 
the, the effect on uncertainty is a big factor, and it could affect Scotland's great tradition of scientific expertise. I think, in theory, yes, it, it could. I mean, the uncertainty has, has been slightly changed here, up in terms of the, terms of the Horizon 2020 program. Um, but actually, you know, the, the development of a next program of research in Europe has already started. And I think it's really important that we're involved in that going forward as well. Um, you know, the, all the active work to develop a, the post-2020 research program has started already, and we need to be part of that. We're going to continue that kind of international cooperation. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have access to all these international cooperation things that will damage our ability to retain and recruit the best talents from around the world, uh, as well as the Scottish-based talent and the UK-based talent, they also want to work in the best possible place in the world. And uh, many of them do in the United States of America, Australia. So we're competing for our own home-based talent as well as the, the other European uh, citizens. Mr Campbell, you talked about the importance of having longer funding streams, such as tenure, yeah. for example. And yes, there may be a case that after 2020, the structural funds are taken home, both by the Scottish Government and the UK Government. But there's no absolute certainty in this. And you've talked about the level of finance that you currently have from European funding. That's going to be a big gap if you suddenly lose 20% in the case of uh, Julie Fitzpatrick, 20% yeah. of your income. And the, the, there's uncertainty there. Obviously, there's potentially replacement funding through the industrial strategy, for example, which is very much geared towards the innovation agenda. But it's not covering all research topics, for example, and we don't know exactly how that's going to pan out in terms of how that money is going to be spent, what areas it's going to get spent on, how it might come to Scotland, for example. So that, that's, there's still uncertainty, even though there's positive moves to uh, increase investment in R&D, there's still uncertainty around what's happening even at a UK level. Uh, if I... Um, thank you, uh, convener. Sorry, uh, Professor Fitzpatrick. Um, just going back to the... Uh, and declare an interest in only a member of the BVA. Um, uh, anecdotal evidence would suggest that up to 95% of the vets uh, in our abattoirs are, are from the European Union and uh, many of them are no longer available. Is that, uh, could you confirm that figure? I couldn't confirm an exact number, but I can certainly provide you with that figure uh, after the committee, but it's, it's a significant proportion of our veterinary back. staff in abattoirs are from um, other EU countries. Um, it's, it's a big concern um, for us um, in relation to, to retention of that workforce. It's a specialised workforce. Um, it's difficult. Um, working env environment um, and very difficult expertise to access from, from within the UK. So it will be a concern for us um, going forward. And the your inspectors are also EU nationals, aren't they? Excuse a proportion me? of your inspectors. The vet veterinary inspectors with, within abattoirs, yes. But directly employed by yourself? Yes. Yeah, yeah. right, okay, thanks. Sorry, Julie, if it's back, come on. Sorry, it was about the previous comment. The pre on you go, then. Well, so, sorry, if I, if I can ju just support uh, Jackie. It is my understanding that it is a very high proportion of um, abattoir uh, veterinary inspection takes place by, by EU uh, qualified people. It, my, my, the point that I just wanted to make was uh, about the, the collaboration again. That I think it's incredibly important um, that, that we do plan uh, to try and keep engaged with the EU as much as possible. Because although we are a small country, if we map our international linkages, there's, there's huge numbers of interactions at all levels with all continents. Um, and as we mentioned before, the big science that we're challenged with, the grand challenges globally, all require collaboration. So anything that reduces collaboration is, um, is a challenge for us and something that needs to be addressed. Of, of time. Um, in terms of um, future employment of EU nationals or EU funding, which you've already mentioned, do you, do you formally put, uh, have a risk register that takes on this as a threat to your organisation in terms of looking at your overall strategy? Mr Campbell? Yes, we do. In fact, it's, um, it's in our risk register. And uh, we also look at means to mitigate that risk. So we've been mm -hmm. investing in giving advice and help to our existing EU, EU citizens in terms of how to mm -hmm. apply for visas, um, arranging um, uh, legal help, for example, through our own uh, solicitors at a discount, for example, trying to provide mm -hmm. supporting mm -hmm. mechanisms to actually ensure that we can keep them as much as possible. That's good. Mm -hmm.
We would be exactly the same. It is included in our risk register, both the staffing issue and also the funding right. issue. Right, good. Thank you. Thank you. Just to wrap this uh, up, Mark Roscoe and then Donald Cameron. Just to push that a bit further, I'm just wondering to what extent international treaties and obligations actually drive some of this collaborative research and whether you see potential from trade deals and cooperation agreements that may come alongside that bilateral, multilateral to really drive the research agenda, or is it all wrapped up in Europe at the moment? The, I mean, there is it's beyond Europe. There's a, a lot of disruption around um, sort of geo, 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 uh, global trade, and I, and I think these could actually raise all sorts of research questions, particularly about primary production in terms of food, where it's grown in the world, um, and you couple that with climate change, we could be looking at a very, very different scenario of the types of um, food products that we actually have to produce in the future. So I think there are lot, some uncertainties there, but there's also maybe opportunities to do more research on novel crops, for example. Uh, we've started doing that. It's partly to meet the localism uh, agenda as well as the globalisation agenda. Uh, first This year we grew soya bean, for example, in Scotland for the first time. We've grown the first uh, crop of hops for the craft brewing industry uh, in Scotland this, uh, in the last two years. So I think there's lots of opportunities to sort of look at alternative uh, products that we can produce in Scotland, which will depend on the how things pan out in the sort of macroeconomics, uh, which is um, somewhat disrupted at the moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, um, as of last Friday, I think uh, um, it has been agreed that EU citizens in the UK can continue to live, work and study as they currently do under the same conditions as under union law. Will you be updating your risk registers to take that into account? Uh, yes, to, to a degree, um, but it's also about the, um, the opportunities to do world-class science. So retention recruitment staff is always in our risk register and there's always pressures on it. So it's about the level of investment in our science generally and the levels of funding that we have and the infrastructure and, and world-class facilities we have. All these things affect retention and recruitment. The European uh, risk is maybe slightly reduced at the moment, um, but I think we would still consider the, the bigger picture in terms of the overall funding uncertainties. Okay. Briefly, Graham Cook. Comment just to say that um, I guess uh, collaborations internationally are something that have taken place across the Safari Institute for a very long time, and uh, there are tens of countries uh, uh, that collaboration has already been undertaken uh, with. So that's a platform to build on, um, and there are conversations within the Safari Gateway that we are looking to have. Uh, building with others, uh, having this sort of dialogue, people like Scottish Enterprise, Scotland Europa, and those sorts of organisations as well, that we'll be looking to demonstrate the relevance of the safari research to. Okay. Julie Fitzpatrick. Could I just make a comment in response to Mr Ruskell's question? Um, in the livestock side, I think the, the EU situation is, is very complex. We have all the issues about export, tariff and trade, but also much of our legislation about animal disease control comes from the EU. So again, there will be changes and it's not clear yet what will happen. So biosecurity and prevention of disease in the UK is, is critical. And obviously Scotland has a very important role to play because we're combined with other um, administrations. And the third area is about registration of veterinary products, how we develop and register products in the future. So the EU issue is, is, um, is, is quite complex and important in the animal sector. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your evidence this morning. It's been very, very informative. Um, if there's any points jump out at you, once you've left the building, please feel free to write to us. As I say, we very much appreciate your contribution. I'm now going to suspend the meeting briefly for the changeover of witnesses. We'll resume in five minutes.
Uh, good morning. Welcome back to the committee scrutiny of the Scottish Government's draft budget 2018-19. We now move to evidence from the Scottish Environment Protection Agency and Scottish Natural Heritage. We're joined by Terry Ahern, the Chief Executive, and Martin Clockwin from Scottish Environment Protection Agency, Francesca Olasovska, Chief Executive, and Alan Hampson, the Action Head, Acting sorry, Head of Corporate Services of Scottish Natural Heritage. Um, as with the first panel, we've got a series of questions. The um, first questions are particularly directed at SNH. Uh, so can I welcome you to your new role before we start off? Um, your new corporate plan, I understand, will have an emphasis on, and I quote, connecting people with nature through leadership, influence and partnership, particularly in towns and cities. I'm just wondering, um, given you can't spend the same pound twice, um, what impact will there be potentially on the rural environment and communities with this changing emphasis or apparent changing emphasis? Uh, thanks very much for the, the question and thanks for the invitation to appear here today. Um, I think in terms of our overall spend, you'll have seen from our annual report last year uh, that our total grant in aid is 47 million and we also um, have funds levered in through other, um, a range of other sources. Much of this is spent in rural areas, so the maintenance of our various um, sites, um, national nature reserves, marine protected areas, um, and a lot of the work that we carry out through the SRDP um, is directed at rural areas. However, as you've identified, we are a national organisation. We want everybody uh, throughout Scotland to have the opportunity to enjoy nature and we've recognised in the past that perhaps those um, individuals living in either urban environments or in um, deprived areas do not have the same access to nature that others have. Um, so what we will do um, if the, the corporate plan is approved in its current form by the Scottish Government, and as you know that's um, still a process that we need to go through we will look to emphasise some of the placemaking work um, that we're involved in, for example, via the Green Infrastructure Fund, um, to ensure that rural, uh, sorry, that urban areas and those living in deprived communities do have the, the access to nature that we feel everyone in Scotland should enjoy. Okay, can I, can I just pick up on that point? Because you're talking there about access to nature, which is, which is all very well and good, but surely the priority is to ensure we have that nature to enjoy in years to come, and shouldn't the focus primarily be on protecting endangered species, for example? Um, we will do that as well. Um, so in terms of our overall budget, as I said, um, we um, allocate a lot to the maintenance of our protected areas. We also allocate um, significant funds to um, ensuring that um, protected species um, continue to protect, be protected. So, as you say, generations um, uh, to come can enjoy nature. But we also um, want to ensure that those in our um, more urban environments and perhaps that don't have the opportunities um, are able to do so. Um, I think in terms of the priorities for the years to come, as I said, we're still going through a process with the corporate plan that will be followed by a more detailed discussion on the business plan for 2018-19, um, both through the senior leadership team in SNH and the board, and then with the Scottish Government to ensure that priorities um, are aligned with um, the Scottish Government priorities. To what extent is this um, sorry, change in emphasis being driven by budgetary considerations? And, and to what extent is it just the view of SNH that this is the way to go? Um, I would say that it has not been driven by budgetary considerations. I think it has been driven by a number of factors which and, um, I would trace back to some of the areas that the Scottish Government has um, highlighted in the in the past, for example, um, I mentioned placemaking earlier. We really see that we have a strong role um, in placemaking. In addition, we also want to combat um, inequalities um, across the piece, and actually, um, access to, to nature could be viewed um, at the moment as unequal. So this is about 
uh, trying to equalise opportunity for Scotland's citizens. And to what extent are you or can you plan for what you anticipate might be additional work streams that come your way? For example, the, the work that's currently being, uh, currently being carried out looking at the future methods of tackling wildlife crime, deer management, could lead to an increased workload for SNEs. I mean, how aware are you of that and to what extent can you anticipate or plan for that happening? So if I can give an example maybe from this year where our budget for peatland increased um, significantly thanks to additional funding uh, from the Scottish Government. Um, we, had, we were prepared for that um, because from previous years we had a pipeline of projects which then allowed us to take forward the peatland um, action restoration programme this year. Similarly, um, we, you know, we don't know what our budget is at, at the moment, um, uh, so you know, I'm slightly wary of speculating, but we feel confident that by um, being able to have the discussions about priorities with the Scottish Government, that we will be able to address any new priorities that emerge, but that will be a conversation that we will have with the Scottish Government once the budget is clear. And focusing particularly on the peatland um, work, which is an excellent programme, um, based on the take-up you've had of that funding for this financial year, do you believe the demand will be there to take that up this um, coming year? We, we do have a, a very strong pipeline of projects. So um, if, and again, I know this is a little bit hypothetical, um, if there was funding allocated to peatland action in future years, then we would be confident of being able to, to satisfy that, that funding stream. Okay, thank you. Mark Ruskell. We've seen a decline in quality of urban green space, um, partly because of council reductions in, in investment in those areas. Is there a danger that you just come in and backfill what councils have already cut? Um, our approach in many areas, including through the Green Infrastructure Fund, is to work in partnership. And we work in partnership with a range of councils and then other bodies who are active um, in that area. So um, I don't believe that we are replacing um, council funding. I would say that what we are doing is enhancing um, what local authorities are already doing through our expertise. Yes, I mean, I think just to, just to add to that, an, another part of the equation is making sure that the councils understand the benefits associated with the green space. So we've been working with four um, councils to develop uh, green health partnerships, which are essentially promoting the benefits of outdoor um, a, a recreation a, activity um, for people, um, and thereby sort of reinforcing the, uh, the you know the importance of maintaining um, good access to green space. Okay, let's move on and look at uh, the work of SEPA. Uh, Kate Forbes. Thank you very much and, and welcome uh, to the committee today. As um, Graham Day mentioned, I'd like to focus my questions on SEPA and um, the, your budget and, and your services. In terms of your core services of regulation and flood risk management, have you analysed the resource implications of developing sustainable growth agreements or reforming the permissioning system? And if you have, what would those re resource implications be? So we wouldn't have detailed you know, figures and breakdowns on those two areas, but the, um, the work we've done indicates that what we would be doing in those two areas, for example, the permissioning reform is uh, following better regulation principles. And this often gets misunderstood. It gets badged sometimes as a either your uh, sort of pro-regulation or anti-regulation. In fact, when you reform your permitting system, and what we're doing is this, if you have clearer, simpler permits, then it's easier for a business to know what the law is, what its obligations are. It's easier for us to know whether they're meeting them. It's easier for us to take enforcement action that'll actually work in the court. And it's easier for the public and others, such as parliamentarians, to hold us and the industry to account for whether we're performing. So that permitting reform, we think, over time, will lead to much more effective work and will lead to much more efficient work. We wouldn't have figures on how much more efficient, but we would expect, for example, that the number of people writing permits will go down over time. We'll have a period over the next couple of years as we reform the entire permitting system where there are resources devoted to doing that simplification. Once we've done that, we should have fewer people doing it because it should just roll out. 
and then those resources can be diverted to um, working with business on enforcement, compliance, etc. The sustainable growth agreements are an innovation which we think contributes both to people getting to compliance and people going beyond compliance. So I'll give you a practical example. The first one's with Superglass, an insulation manufacturer in Stirling. So before I joined a couple of years ago, that was one of our poor performing businesses. New management came in. Um, both HSE and SEPA said, your compliance record's very bad. The new management said, well, give us a list of what we need to improve, and progressively, progressively over time, they've got to full compliance. Signing the Sustainable Growth Agreement takes them further, so they're going beyond the standards um, in terms of environmental performance. They're now, one of the highlights in the agreement is they're now going to work with the local community. So at the launch of the Sustainable Growth Agreement, a community member said to me, um, I have to clean my own car now, and it's your fault. And I said, I've been accused of lots of things as a regulator around the world, I don't understand that. And he said, because the air pollution was so bad several years ago, Superglass paid for people to wash, people's, uh, wash cars in the local area. The air pollution's come right down to the standards. In the Sustainable Growth Agreement, they're now looking at how they can work with the local community on partnership work to improve environmental performance. That agreement will entrench their compliance performance. We would hope to spend less time because they've signed up at CEO level. You don't get a sustainable growth agreement unless the CEO signs. So that I signed and their CEO signed to say we will maintain our compliance performance and we'll do better. So they now have an additional incentive um, on top of just our potential enforcement. They've gone out to the world and said, we've signed this agreement, we will comply and we'll go further. So we think the sustainable growth agreements will contribute to beyond compliance performance and entrenched compliance um, certainty for the community. So that may well have answered my next question, which was one of your other actions was um, to investigate new approaches to enforcement to tackle non-compliance at an earlier stage. So I presume that's an answer to that point as well, is it? Or are there um, alternative ways? There are alternative ways. So in our One Planet Prosperity strategy, we have a clear statement that compliance is non-negotiable. So I don't know any regulator in the world that achieves 100% compliance, but that's what we're aiming for. And I don't see why the people of Scotland should get anything less than 100%. We may never get quite there, but that's what we're aiming for. That will mean everything from the Sustainable Growth Agreement entrenching compliance because it leads to executive and board level commitment from a regulated business. But in addition, we will use the full range of measures. So that's one thing we can do. Um, we have a new set of power enforcement powers that the parliament gave us two or three years ago, fixed monetary penalties, very mon variable monetary penalties, enforcement undertakings. So we are starting to roll those out and we will use a broader set of enforcement tools in addition to this new and broader set of encouragement tools. I guess they're all forms of encouragement. Some are encouragement through a penalty and some are encouragement through signing up to say that we will be um, exceptional citizens. And I presume citizens. you think that all of that will lead to savings? Yes, it, over time, what that should do is mean we can get compliance more effectively and powerfully. Um, and then there's either savings, which can be passed back to people paying charges if we lower our costs, or can be diverted into other public uses, either our money, either for our budget or someone else's. And I don't back away from that. Uh, talking about charges, how do you set your charges and costs? And has income from um, the charging scheme remained static over the last few years? So the charges are set through uh, a process of saying there's two, two parts to it. What are the costs of our regulation? So that means writing permits, doing inspections, etc. So the direct work we do. The indirect work that supports that is, say, monitoring work. So if we're regulating businesses that affect a lock, then we'll be monitoring the lock and we will cover, recover part of that cost. So it's making sure that the work we do that um, is for direct regulation is costed. We then um, assess that, and we had a major reform a couple of years ago, uh, against the level of effort that we need to uh, put into each business so that it's uh, proportionate for the the costs that we have, you know, Scottish Water pays a lot more than a small operator. And so the other part of the question, um, the idea of that was that it was revenue neutral. So it goes up and down a bit, largely dependent on economic activity, um, but it's remained reasonably static over the last few years. Pick up on that issue of proportionality, because you, I think you're getting a piece of work just now to take to government around charging. Um, and we take examples of agriculture, where I understand there has been some suggestion of very substantial increases 
in um, abs around abstraction. Um, how do you take account of whether a sector can actually bear substantial increases in costs, as is the case with agriculture currently? So the principles that underlie the charging scheme are about cost recovery. So the core principle is if you use the environment to run your business and generate income, then you should pay the proportionate cost of what society spends through us on regulation. Um, and that has been a principle that has been uh, adhered to. We will then look at, um, in consultation with government, whether there is any need to make progressive changes or allow for that ability to pay. But we try to stick very much to the core principle because the more you break from it, the more you start. We put a lot of work in the last few years into trying to get it to be more accurate and fair to everyone. So the more you start breaking from that, the harder it is to maintain the fairness and equity in the system. And I get that, but with a sector like agriculture, which right now is under a great deal of pressure, surely that needs to be a factor that's taken account of? Or is that something for government to take account of when they make a decision on whether to agree with what you're proposing or not? So we would have good consultation as we have with NFUS and others, um, as well as individuals that make uh, representation. We take that into account and then put positions to government. Ultimately, it's a policy position for government to make. OK, thank you. Sorry, Kate. Just moving on to um, budget allocations, I wonder if you could provide any examples of where budget allocations have impacted either positively or negatively on relevant indicators in the national performance framework, which presumably guides those allocations. Um, look, I'll, I'll give a very um, uh, general answer, but for me, very clear answer to this. You know, I've moved around the world and everywhere I go, there are budget cuts. It's a part of life. So like any administrator, I would like more money or at least to maintain my budget. But my approach is to work with colleagues and say, whatever money we get, we will look to make maximum effect with. And if you think about the messages that the government has and that an organisation like SEPA has under government policy about abstract concepts like the circular economy or resource efficiency, we are saying to the world, for example, SEPA says, if everyone in the world lived like Scots, we'd need three planets as only one. So we need to become much smarter and cleverer as a society to use the natural resources. I have the same approach with our financial resources from working with my colleagues. So um, compared to some other jurisdictions I've been in, we haven't had uh, huge budget cuts in my time at SEPA. We've had cuts and they're difficult. But our focus is how do we use that money much more effectively to deliver against the national performance income uh, indicators. So I couldn't say that we've had any impact that's negative on our ability to contribute. That may change in the future, you know, if cuts keep coming, but our focus will be on how do we be more innovative to deliver against the indicators. Great, thank you. One last question, which is quite cheeky. Um, it, in terms of other portfolios and their priorities, um, at the moment, do you identify any particular priorities in terms of spending priorities which will exacerbate environmental challenges in Scotland? It is um, every human activity impacts on the environment. Um, so we take more of an approach of uh, if Scotland is to be prosperous like any nation, things will happen. So whether it's transport development, education, how do we work with those portfolios to minimise the environmental impact so they can achieve the mobility aims that the transport portfolio will have or the education aims that the education department will have. There are obviously areas like transport, which if you look at, say, the carbon footprint for Scotland is significant. Um, but we don't... Uh, it's more that we would say everything needs innovation. How do we get in and support people being innovative? Where it's a regulated sector, again, we would be very clear. We would say, well, there are legal standards you have to comply. Um, if you can do that through innovation and it saves you money, great, and we'll help you with that. But if it's going to cost you money, the only way to meet the standards is to do that or get you there via that, whether that's transport or anything else. Beyond that, we're looking for the win-win because beyond the legal standards, there's no reason for anyone to do anything unless it improves transport outcomes or education outcomes or commercial outcomes. Great, thank you very much. Um, OK, let's move this on. Richard Lyle. Yeah, on staffing and gender balance, uh, so if you bear with me. Uh, but uh, to SNH first, um, in your submission, you say that you've made uh, a 25% reduction in staffing over the last six years. How many staff did you have 
six years ago and how many staff do you have now? Um, so our headcount for 2010-2011, which is um, the, the baseline that we usually use given significant organisation change at that point, was 907 and the FTE in that year was 770. We our uh, latest headcount um, of the 1st of April this year was 711 with FTE of 603. Thank you. Uh, to both CEPA and SNH, what percentage of your budget relates to staffing? Uh, is staffing level stable or will further cuts have to be made? Um, so our staff, uh, the percentage of our um, budget which is taken up by staff costs is 49%. Um, and um, as I said earlier, in terms of uh, future budget, uh, we will kind of look at the potential for any um, reduction or who knows, um, increase um, in staffing levels um, once, we, um, once we know what the Scottish Government budget allocation is going to be for 18-19. SNH, there's a queer drop in the number of staff, but you have people like volunteer wardens assisting you in your work. You've wrapped their study groups uh, assisting you. Are they in any way filling that staffing gap? Um, in terms of our kind of volunteer workers, and you've mentioned some, but also through the National Nature Reserves, we have a range of volunteers who support us. Um, I think it would be quite difficult to say that um, they're filling a, a gap in terms of our paid staff. Um, where we've looked to make efficiencies in terms of our pay bill is um, around um, some of our kind of corporate work, um, for example, um, and some of our kind of planning and case work. So, for example, on planning, we're now doing a lot more um, what they term upstream work with developers, which kind of can release staff to do that. I simply make the point because you, know, you talked earlier about access to nature. Well, volunteer wardens, for example, do a lot of work to enable that to happen. In terms of tackling wildlife crime, the work of the raptor study groups, by and large, are, uh, is quite important. So I'm just trying to get a feel for the extent to which, in addition to the workforce that you employ, you actually have considerably more people assisting SNH in its work. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. Um, in terms of the number of volunteers that are involved in SNH, I don't have a precise figure on that, but can maybe come back to you? That's, that's fine. It was just, I just wanted to get that on the record. Sorry, Mr Lyle. Yes, uh, Mr Ahern, can you tell us how many staff? So it's just under 1,200 FTEs, and it's about 60% of our staff co of our total budget. Okay. Um, and Sipa, how are you simplifying permitted processes Proven enforcement, and what does this mean for operational uh, and staff costs? Uh, and um, can I be cheeky in asking how many staff you have in your HQ? And I maybe have to declare you actually are in my constituency of Odinson and Belsill. And how many uh, staff do you have in the field? Um, in, in HQ, the Stirling office, we have, I think, around about 200 staff, but some of those are the field staff. Or Sorry, I was meaning your office in Maxim Park. Oh, OK, it's about 400. Right. Um, and some of those are field staff. So we have the labs um, in, at Eurocentral. Yeah. Um, but there's also a lot of the people who do the regulatory work out in, in the West. I think the staff in the field is around about five to 600. Right. OK, thank you. We're on that point, Mr... Uh, Mr. Helm, because we, we, you and I have discussed this before in previous sessions about the strength of SEPA being its local footprint. Uh, you've given undertakings to try and pr uh, protect that as much as you could. Have you managed to do that? Yeah, so we have, we're have we at 26 different offices. A lot of those are shared uh, around Scotland, and we've got a commitment to, as much as we can, keep those offices and that local presence. Um, we've strengthened it in various ways, so we're introducing a um, system where will make very formalised that the local officers are in charge of local relationships. So, for example, we've never had uh, managers, uh, people responsible for the management of a company relationship. So if you take, say, an aquaculture, marine harvest or Scottish sea farms, we have local officers who will look at the four, someone in Thurso will look after four um, fish site licences or permits, but we haven't had anyone looking after marine harvest. So all those people will be from the local offices. So we're maintaining the offices and we're giving them strengthened responsibilities. Because for me, they are the front line of what we do. 
But do you then collate the information that they gather? So say, for example, a major company in any sector that perhaps is not discharging its responsibilities quite as it ought to, do you kind of collate that national information to get that picture to allow you to take a more strategic view of their activities? Yeah, for a number of years, we've produced an annual compliance assessment scheme report, so you can get that sort of information there. The permitting reforms, the client management reforms, the sector plan approach that we're taking will enable us to do that in a more in a stronger way. Take that information we have, and be able to say to companies much more clearly, you know, you've got 40 sites that are compliant, you've got six that aren't. It's on these parameters. Let's agree an approach to quickly get you into compliance. Okay, that's good to hear. I'll let Mark Ruskell in before we come back to Richard Lyle. Are you able to, this is a question to SEPA, um, are you able to actually focus your resources on particular areas? I'll give you an example. I was met with the communities around Moss Moran on yep. Friday, and there was a real concern that their demands for detailed residential noise monitoring had been mm -hmm. turned down by SEPA because they just simply didn't have the staff available. Now, that's an anecdotal case, yep. but it does point to a concern out there that where there's a particular set of problems that SEPA needs to address, communities often find that the resources, the boots on the ground, actually aren't there to take a more enhanced form of regulation mm. that I think your, your stakeholders at community level would demand. Yeah. So the sectoral approach that we're taking, where we'll have a sector plan for each sector that we regulate, so the first six uh, areas like aquaculture, whiskey, landfills, we'll have a very clear and public um, explanation of how many sites there are in that sector, which ones are non-compliant, what the beyond compliance opportunities are, and then that will enable us to devote more resources to say, if there's 10 non-compliant sites, how do we target our resources effectively to get rid of those 10 and get them all up to compliance? And I would hope that that would mean that in the sort of example you talk about, we would be able to have a more focused approach to solve problems, work with communities on what they see the impacts are, and knock things off more quickly and powerfully. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mr. Oyl, to finish up on the gender issue. My last two questions. Um, together, in regard to gender balance, overall gender balance of uh, CEPA and SNH staff, whether there's difference across uh, full or part-time part workers, and what is the gender balance of senior managers and boards? And uh, lastly, what work has been done to address gender imbalance across both your organisations? Do you want me to go, given you've had a bit of it? Um, so in terms of SNH, the overall balance of staff, um, male to female, is 40% male, 60% um, female at the board is the same. So actually we have more female um, board members than male. And for our senior leadership team, which is myself, um, three directors, um, and three heads of service, um, it's 50-50. Um, in terms of the work that we're doing to um, ensure kind of gender balance within the organisation, um, we, we promote um, flexible working very actively, and we've got a good take-up of flexible working, and we're also doing some work on um, gender pay issues. A shining example for others, then. Thank you. So at SEPA, it's 54% of staff are female, 46% are male. Um, at a, the board level, we've got seven, seven male and four female, so it's 64%, 46%. There's a focus on changing that as we have recruitment over the next couple of years. The executive team, when I joined, I had five executives, four male, one female. I've split a, one role, so it's six, and I've now got three male, three female. In the next tier down, it's pretty even and we've got a program in place to um, try and ensure that that flows much more strongly over time so that we're starting to get much more even spread right throughout the levels. So an excellent example in, in work in progress. I hope so, yes. Thank you. Alan Hampson, you want to come, I was just going to come back on uh, the scale of volunteering effort um, that you were asking about. So on our own uh, National Nature Reserves, it's about 4,500 days of uh, volunteering per annum. Um, and through our grants, we support volunteering opportunities in the region of 85 to 90,000 every year. So it's quite a substantial It is number. substantial. Yeah. Can I just pick up on uh, Francesca's point? You talked earlier about um, flexible working. Do either of your organisations participate in the Care or Positive initiative? 
Not that mm. I know of, but um, forgive me, I'm still kind of day 40-something. Yeah, I appreciate <laughs> that. I think it's, I would encourage both of you to look at that okay, because it allows carers into the workforce. You know, yep. It's a very important sector. So okay. I can just, I've got that on the record. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on, um, David Stewart. Can I move us on to Brexit? Um, have you assessed the financial effects of leaving the EU, particularly uh, for your respective um, organisations? Can I start with uh, SIPA? Um, well, we've looked at the various impacts of Brexit. As you know, it's huge. Um, we have some funding, particularly in the waste area, that's EU-based. Uh, so we'll be lo we're looking at how we can maintain that. Um, the other financial impacts on us like direct financial impacts on budget are not really significant from Brexit, except in the sense that there are specific areas where um, there, there will clearly need to be some alternative like chemicals management. So are we going to stay in the REACH program or do we come out? How do we replicate that? Um, but um, what we've done is work with officials to focus on the very specific areas where we think we have responsibilities, where there are clear, urgent needs, REACH, what happens to the emissions trading scheme, et cetera. Um, at the moment, we wouldn't necessarily see huge environmental impacts with the, sorry, financial impacts for our budget, with the caveat that there's so much uncertainty. Okay, good. Nice energy. Yes, as you'll be aware, we um, leave a significant funding um, through EU programs at the moment, and part of our preparations for EU exit are to work with partners um, to think through alternative um, sources of funding should the, that funding not be available. Obviously, um, again, um, we don't know how those future EU schemes are going to be taken forward um, by the Scottish Government or by the, the UK Government, but we're working with partners to ensure that we understand the implications for them on future, uh, of future funding decisions. Mm. You had a quick look through um, SNH's European funding, um, and I make it around 57 million if you include SRDP, yeah. ERDF, and EU Life. Uh, is, is that figure accurate, or is there more funds that I haven't identified there? Um, that is the, the majority of the funds. There's a tiny amount that we receive through LEADER, but 57 is a, is a good headline figure. I mean, for SRDP, that is a significant chunk of the SRDP budget. And at one level, congratulations for managing to lever as much as of that in. However, if that doesn't uh, continue after 2020, that's going to be a big gap in your future programmes. Is this part of your risk register as well? Yes, it is. Because that is, that is very substantial. It, it is substantial. And in terms of the EU exit work that we're doing, um, kind of continuity of funding is... Um, one of the, the main issues, and we're discussing that with partners. Um, the other issues that we're looking at um, are around day one readiness, such as making sure our documentation is up to date, working with the Scottish Government um, on kind of some of the, the legal issues as well. And as far as employment is concerned, do either organisation have significant um, EU nationals employed? Uh, we have 23 staff with EU and EEA nationality, which is 18 female and 5 male. Okay, and for we have CIPA. Uh, it's in the same range, so we've done a lot of work with them to support them, etc. Yeah. And have you have you picked up any sort of anxieties about future employment as far as EU nationals are concerned? Yes, uh, I would say all our people in that category have some anxiety, some more than others. Um, the Scottish government has a, a working group across the public sector um, <coughs> for EU nationals, and one of our EU nationals participates on that group, which I think is a, a helpful um, line of communication and support. Mm. I mean, and as Donna Cummins identified um, in the last session, clearly there's some negotiation around this, I think, which, and reciprocity, which we would all welcome. But it's also thinking about the, you know, the future generations um, from the EU who might wish to work in Scotland. That, that point is still, is still vague. So I think there's still some issues to be worked out there. But my final question, I think, is around, and I think you've touched on this partly, is looking at alternative sources of income if you suddenly lose that big chunk of EU funding. What sort of work has been done by both organisations around that? So we've set up a, what we call a commercial services team. I'm not sure in retrospect that's the, the right name for it, um, but it's looking mainly at overseas work. So it ranges from um, accessing EU funding, other forms of international funding, other forms of UK funding, 
through to general commercial work where we will advise people internationally. We are very deliberately not competing with others in Scotland. We don't think that's appropriate for a monopoly mm. regulator to do. But the job of that team is to say whether you know, we're in the EU or not, um, and budgets will become increasingly tight. What are the opportunities to bring in other forms of revenue over time? So presumably you, you're focusing particularly on um, out with EU countries in terms of new markets? Uh, we're doing both. So we're gaining some. We signed, we're a minor signatory to an agreement in India last week, but we're also, ex, you know, our major project is a um, funded project in Cyprus. So we're continuing to look at both to try and um, harness and exploit the opportunities, whether it's inside EU or outside. So that would be for effectively um, um, ensuring that you've got extra income because of your expertise across the world that would draw income into your organisation? Yeah, it's multiple benefits for Scotland. So yes, income is clearly one of them, but it's also staff development. Uh, we learn when we work overseas from others um, and it enables us to build, uh, maintain and build relationships with others. So if we're out of formal processes, having other ways of interacting with people or colleagues in Europe is very important as well. So it has a multiple set of benefits. Yes, Anich? Um, similar um, to, to Terry, we're working with our partners to identify alternative sources of funding. We're obviously also in touch with similar bodies across the UK so that we have an understanding of the, the UK picture. And I think throughout this process, being clear in terms of our priorities and where we can lever funds for some of our key priorities, such as, as biodiversity. But Alan, do you want to add to that? We've just completed an initial review um, to help us look at the opportunities to diversify our funding. I mean, that covers both generating income for ourselves, but also um, sources of funding that can support the sector as a whole. Um, we will be, over the next few months, looking at that general review, uh, uh, identifying the opportunities within that, and looking at the impacts um, of those, taking forward those opportunities, as well as you know the resourcing around taking them forward. Um, so it's, a, it's an active area of work for us that we're, we're pursuing. Thank you. Thank you. This is perhaps a little bit unfair for a relatively new chief executive, but if we go back three or four years ago to the point where people in restoration was more about ambition than it was reality, there was a lot of talk then that if the Scottish Government put up a degree of funding, there would be external funding to be leveraged in. Are we starting to see that yet? I mean, you know, there was about £10 million of Scottish Government funding, but we all know that the demand may well outstrip that. So what other sources of funding, if any, are being identified to support this work? That, that is one of the areas that we've identified in, in this review of diversification of funding. What's the opportunity to bring in not just third sector money in terms of the restoration work, but also potentially private sector money in terms of utilising some of the benefits of, of carbon capture? Um, it's early days, but we've, we've had some initial... Um, We've had some initial discussion with some quite big players about what the potential might be there. Oh, it's a pension funds, that sort of thing? Um, we haven't approached pension funds directly, but that's one of the, uh, one of the areas that was identified in our, in our work. OK, thank you. John Scott and then Mark Roscoe. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Um, and declaring an interest as a former SNH be aware that landowners and farmers are having difficulties accessing the IX scheme. Is this a function of budget reductions or staff reductions or for other reasons? In terms of the um, agri-environment scheme, um, you'll be aware that it's quite a complex process and we've been working very hard with the, the Scottish Government to ensure that um, um, farmers and others are able to access that scheme through the complexities. Um, I, you know, and, and again, I'm, I'm not trying to use this as a, an excuse, but my understanding of the trajectory here, some of which predates um, my arrival in the organisation, is that um, the processes have improved recently, and that's taken quite a lot of effort by our own staff, but also from uh, the, the Scottish Government. Um, if you had any particular cases um, that you'd want to bring to our attention, um, I'd be very happy to discuss those in more detail. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mark Roscoe. How might your work change post-Brexit once we lose the European Court of Justice and the, uh, the offices of the European Commission? Um, difficult to speculate because we don't know what's going to come in their place. Um, we know that the UK government has made um, an announcement on kind of potential future regulatory regime. It's not clear um, whether that applies to the devolved administrations or not. We know that the Scottish government um, is pursuing that actively with DEFRA. 
Um, in terms of SNH's role, obviously, as an NDPB, we will be guided by whatever regulatory regime the Scottish Government um, puts in place. I wouldn't have much to add except that whatever system is in place, I think my earlier answer about the uh, clearer simplified permits is important because the more as a regulator you make it very crystal clear what law requires of people, the easier it is for whatever institutional arrangements exist to work. So I don't have any any insights into what will come uh, to replace that forum, but I would hope that our system will be even better to be scrutinised. Yeah. Have your boards discussed this and do they have a preference? In terms of regulatory regime? In terms of what replaces both the Commission and the ECJ? Uh, no, they haven't. Okay. No, I mean, our board gets a regular update on Brexit, but we haven't had a discussion about that particular issue. Okay. okay uh, let's move this on. Uh, Donald Cameron. <coughs> Thank you. A couple of questions for SNH uh, around biodiversity. Um, there's uh, clearly going to be a transition between the, the framework grant structures and the new challenge funds. Um, and my question is really, when will there be greater clarity around those new challenge funds? Um, so we had a meeting, well, Alan actually had held a meeting with the key recipients um, of the, the framework grants just recently to um, talk through in, in some detail the move to the challenge fund. should say that we've these discussions have been ongoing for some time. Uh, so I, this, I hope, would not have been any surprise to the bodies in receipt of the, the framework grants. Um, we're confident that that will be a kind of clear process from the beginning of the financial year when we start um, the challenge fund. I'll maybe ask Alan to elaborate on that. Yes, I mean, the, the idea of the challenge fund is to, to, to target the, the money we have at priorities in terms of the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. I mean, just to put it into scale, though, I mean, we're talking about around about 5% of the money that we make available in grant funding going into these challenge funds. Um, we, in the past, have held open grant rounds where people were, were, were able to just pitch in. Um, what we found was it was increasingly difficult to target that money to where it was being um, best used, and therefore the challenge fund approach is really more like a sort of mini grant round which will enable us to better target um, the priorities and also to ensure best value for money in terms of those that are, that are offering to contribute. One of the points made to us is that there is um, a feeling that there is a lack of funding support for diversity, sort of for biodiversity um, in general. Um, can you offer any assurances uh, to um, interested organisations? I think we've got to change how we offer that support. Um, I mean, there are some big challenges out there in terms of biodiversity. What we need are bigger, um, more strategic partnership projects which pool people's resources, get agreement around the common priorities and leave in as much external funding as possible. So we're looking to help lead the way to develop those bigger, more impactful projects. Can I just maybe comment on um, that? I think it's important to focus on the outcomes that are being delivered and certainly in terms of biodiversity, the committee will be aware of the um, route map to 2020 and we published an interim report on that earlier this year um, we hope to publish a second annual report um, next year and in terms of the 12 priority projects um, two were um, rated as complete um, eight were rated as on track and two were areas where we did want to see more progress now since that um, that public that document was published which I think shows very good progress on biodiversity targets. Um, we have done some further work and I'm hoping that the second annual report will show an even even better outcome. Up on the point about you, you as an organisation have done work, I just want to explore briefly your relationship with the Royal Botanic Gardens because ultimately they are doing a great deal of the work that I hesitate to say this, that SNH may get the credit for ultimately as endangered species are saved and biodiversity is enhanced. So what is the relationship with the, the botanics? Um, it, it, it's nice to feel that we do get the credit for some of our <laughs> biodiversity um, work. Not just the criticism. Yeah. Um, in, in, indeed. Um, so 
the, the Scottish Government has brought together a range of bodies um, in the environmental field under the leadership of Bridget Campbell in what's known as EELG, um, which is not a very pretty um, acronym, but it's the Environment and Economy Leaders Group, and that brings together bodies um, such as SNH, SEPA, um, the Botanic Gardens, the two national parks, and so on. And through that mechanism, I think that's been a really excellent mechanism for collaboration. Um, the Botanics and SNH do collaborate on a range of biodiversity, um, scientific studies, um, and research. Thank you. So, Donald and then Mark Russell. <coughs> Thank you. Just one last question. Um, given there's been a decrease, uh, we've already spoken about this, in agri-environment funding, uh, as well as um, spend on SNH management agreements declining, as well as um, site condition monitoring uh, funding declining. Uh, what impact w will that have um, on biodiversity, in your view? I think I would refer back to the, the point about outcomes and... Um, you know, as, as Terry said earlier, as a you know, as a as a government body, we will work with the budget that we have. And if the the budget decreases, um, then the the key for us is to prioritise to those areas of greatest need. And in terms of the biodiversity work, I think we have good outcomes on the route map. We have good outcomes on the HE targets, um, and we will continue to focus on those areas where we feel. Um, that biodiversity needs to be enhanced. Isn't there a danger with the challenge funding that just leads to short-termism, though? Uh, I would use the example, perhaps, of hogweed, where you know you need a long-term approach, a catchment-wide approach. Um, but if the funding comes for a couple of years and it stops, then one or two years later you're just back to square one again. The hogweed's taken over the catchment, and then you're having to reinvest. So, in terms of adopting a preventative approach to spend. Are there, are, there, are there challenges with your challenge fund? And that's where the bigger, more strategic projects that I'm referring to are become essential because, I mean, with, when, with dealing with an invasive species like giant hogweed, you can carry on putting the same money into the same area year in year, but unless you're actually treating the root cause of that, all you're doing is treating the symptoms. So the, the money that we're now putting into addressing INS we're working with a number of partners through a, a, a national steering group to ensure that we are investing the money in treating the causal um, uh, origin of these things rather than just constantly treating the, um, the, the symptoms, which is what was tended to happen probably more than it should have been in the past. Okay. Is that going to be long term enough to actually tackle the problem? Because you, know, you can't tackle it within two years. I'm just using that as an example. It maybe needs a 10-year approach on a catchment basis to then eradicate, if you ever can eradicate, a, a non-native invasive species. So I'm just, I'm just, I'm just trying to understand the, exactly what's in the budget this year and exactly how you're going to address that over time. I mean, I'm sorry, I think, I mean, in, in terms of the, the issue that you highlight, I would say that I wouldn't distinguish um, between challenge funding and grant funding because right. they're, you know, both are the annual processes. What we try and do in either scenario is make sure that we understand the kind of long-term impact, you know, so the hogweed example, what is going to be the recurring need for funding, um, whether it's through grant or through challenge fund, as Alan has said, um, looking at a much broader <laughs> scale intervention. And that allows us, in terms of um, future budget considerations, to understand the pipeline of funding that will be needed. Okay, thank you. Um, I touched very briefly earlier on in the dreaded D word. Now we'll return to deer and and its ma and their management. Um, the direction of travel, as this committee heard during its scrutiny of deer management, appeared to be SNH cutting funding to DMGs. And there were a couple of examples we were given where DMGs had been asked to step in and provide the funding to continue like, to continue one project to develop another. So I'm just wondering um, how you see that progressing and how uh, we can expect deer management groups to, to start to do what they ought to be doing if the funding support is going down. So the overall funding support for um, deer management has not reduced. However, we know that there are some deer management groups, and this came out of our deer review, that are actually managing um, deer in that locality very well and actually don't need as much support 
um, as, as they might have been given. There are other deer management groups um, who are either facing a kind of more complex um, set of issues or for whatever reason need more support. So what we've done is try and target our funding onto those deer management groups who actually need it the most. Yes, we've written to them um, asking what sort of issues they, they face and making it clear that um, we'll be taking a more robust approach to, uh, to addressing the, uh, the issues in the future. Okay. You, I think you, you've indicated to us that you've secured a, an additional £175,000 of funding from the Scottish Government uh, for deer management. How's that being deployed and is that in any way adequate for the task that you face? Um, so in terms of that deployment, that's um, that's um, one point. <coughs> excuse me, me. It, that funding has come available through some recycling of SRDP funding with the Scottish Government's um, agreement, and that is being used for habitat assessment and control measures in particular areas. Um, we're confident that through the work that we do with deer management groups, that we can um, make. Um, great strides in addressing these issues. We prefer wherever we can to have a very good dialogue with the local community. Um, and I think in you know the majority of cases, we do have that very good dialogue, which leads to um, voluntary um, cooperation and voluntary agreements in terms of management of deer in the locality. But not in every case. Um, sometimes not in every case, but some of the kind of more well-documented areas um, where um, it's been a more challenging uh, situation. Actually, we have worked with um, all the partners in those areas to arrive at a position that all stakeholders can agree. But we, we understand the challenges, but part of our role is to appreciate the different views, the different needs, and the different outcomes sought from different partners and try and negotiate a solution. In terms of the costs associated with uh, policing deer management, I mean, how expensive are Section 7 orders if they work, if they don't? And what are the costs associated with Section 8? So, although we know as a committee that some of the SNH has seemed reluctant to, to move to. I think our reluctance to move to Section 7 and Section 8 is not um, simply a cost equation. It, it's back to my earlier points about actually we tend to get much better outcomes when it's a, a, a negotiated settlement, if I can use that uh, phrase. Um, in terms of the actual costs of Section 7 and Section 8, I don't have that information, but I'd be happy to provide it. But what you're saying is, is, is cost is not the determining factor about how robustly you pursue this? No, cost is not. We, um, we would much prefer and we see that we arrive at better outcomes when we have voluntary agreements that all members of the community and all stakeholders can sign up to. And this is not a strict budget question, but it would be remiss of me to pass up the opportunity, given our interest in the subject. What progress is being made around Section 7s um, since this committee uh, produced its report? Are we seeing any further progress? In terms of their use? In terms, well, not just of their use, of their effectiveness, because there were considerable questions asked about the effectiveness or elements of the effectiveness of Section 7s. At the um, time. I don't have that information, but well, Alan, or, or we can write to you. Yeah, I mean, that's where some of the additional money is helping, because it's actually un it's, it's paying for habitat assessment so that th the, the impact of the deer can be made much clearer. Um, and it's also helping support control um, work as well. So it's a bit of incentive to actually get out and get on with the, with the work that's been on the table for a while. OK. No doubt we and you will return to the subject no in due course. Um, if members have asked explore other subjects they wish to. Um, can I thank all of you for your time this morning? That has been very useful, very helpful, and um, wish you all a good Christmas when it comes around. Uh, thank you. At its next meeting on the 19th of December, the committee will hear evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform as part of the committee's scrutiny of the Scottish Government's draft budget 2018-19. It will also, at that point, consider its work programme. We will now move into private session, and I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is closed. <laughs>